Folks, Harris. We're pushing up on nine, a little after nine, so we'll go ahead and get started. So, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us at the Rocky Mountain MS Spring Education Summit this morning. Uh, my name is Dave Janetta. I'm the chairman of the board of directors of the MS Center, and I'm filling in today for Gina Hensrud, our CEO, who is unfortunately out of town and can't join us, but she sends her best. On behalf of the uh, board and the entire staff of the Rocky Mountain MS Center, I want to welcome you. Uh, to the CU Anschutz Medical Center this morning for our education summit. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize our online viewer, viewers and welcome them uh, that are looking through that camera right now. We had over hundreds of people register for the event from across 40 states uh, and even across the globe, England, Ireland, and Australia as a couple countries to name uh, of folks that are, are, are joining us today. So welcome. I'm excited that you can join uh, such a great opportunity to, to learn a little bit more about MS today. We have an interesting slate of presentations, uh, including some very cutting edge concepts where the doctors are leading the research effort on. Uh, two points that I want to highlight. The MS Center clinical team contributes more than half of all the research done in the neurology department at the University of Colorado Hospital. And second, they have been involved in clinical trials on nearly every pharmaceutical drug that treats MS today. So it's really exciting to be here this morning to listen uh, to these doctors and the research that they are doing. Uh, we believe that an informed patient is an empowered patient, and it's you all that are at the center of the Rocky Mountain MS Center and everything that we do. Our mission is to improve the quality of life of individuals living with MS and their families and related neurological diseases through care, support, education, and research. I would like to thank our exhibitors today, Biogen, EMD Serono, Genentech, and Novartis Pharmaceuticals. And we'd also like to uh, acknowledge our community exhibitor, Accessible Systems. So uh, please take a moment today. Uh, we will have breaks throughout the day. Um, and, and visit their display tables out in the lobby. And we also have a, a graphic timeline of the 40 years that the Rocky Mountain MS Center has been in operation. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, I would encourage you to take a look at all the milestones and accomplishments of, the, of what the Rocky Mountain MS Center does. Uh, we also have received patient education grants and sponsorships from Novartis Pharmaceuticals, Genentech, Biogen, and Celgene. And we're able to continue to bring the MS Summit to you free of charge uh, and no cost thanks to their generous support. So thank you all. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce Michelle King. She is the Senior Director at KDEP. And KDEP stands for the King Adult Day Enrichment Program. She has worked at the MS Center for more than 15 years. If you haven't been to KDEP, uh, which is at our Westminster facility, I would encourage you to visit and get a sense of the great program that it is and what it does. KDEP is one aspect of the care part of our mission at the MS Center. Michelle? Thank you, David. <clears throat> it is so good to see you all today. Thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. Our agenda features five presentations from the neurologist at the Rocky Mountain MS Center Center at CU, as well as a registered dietitian. We'll continue, conclude the day with question and answer panel. There are index cards on your table. Please write your questions down on them as we move through the presentations. Volunteers will be around to collect them. Please do not wait until the Q&A to hand in your questions to a volunteer. If you are watching our live YouTube channel, you can submit questions in the comment box. We will have two breaks during the program. These breaks are an opportunity to enjoy refreshments, to connect with fellow attendees, and to visit our exhibitors. The complete PowerPoints and recording of the summit will be posted on our website at mscenter.org. I'd also like to call your attention to a very important item in your packet, the blue evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to fill it out before you leave today. If you turn it in and include your contact information, we will be randomly drawing two evaluations after, each, after the event to each win a $25 gift card. Online viewers, please be sure to go to our website to fill out the evaluation form. There is a direct link in the YouTube description. You can leave the finished evaluations on your table drop or drop it in the blue evaluation box at the registration table on your way out. 
If your comments won't fit on the evaluation form, please feel free to use a note card to drop in the box as well. <clears throat> and finally, some logistics before we kick off the presentations. Please silence or power down your cell phones. Restrooms are located outside the auditorium down a short hallway on the right. There is a second set on the first floor. Also, if you have any questions or would like to learn more about the work we do, please feel free to ask any of our staff members. Our entire team worked hard to bring this event together, and any one of us would be happy to talk with you. There is an RMMSC table in the back of the room, and Alyssa is available to answer questions. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. John Corboy to the podium. Dr. Corboy is the co-director of the Rocky Mountain MS Center at the University of Colorado. His research interests and projects include novel therapeutics for MS, treatment decisions in MS care, understanding how long to use conventional DMTs, and defining risk factors for development of MS. Dr. Corboy will be presenting on where we are and where we have come from in MS. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate that. Everybody can hear me all right? High out in the uh, electrons. All good? Uh, great. There are my dis uh, disclosures. And I have the daunting task about where we've been forever before, where we are now, and where we're going. So this is going to be a uh, high-level uh, discussion uh, with uh, not, uh, not a lot of details. So uh, bear with me if it might seem that way. That's the intent. Um, clinical descriptions for multiple sclerosis go back hundreds of years. If you look at either in novels or in uh, just reports of a variety of different types of literature that existed back then, but the first major descriptions of multiple sclerosis, uh, sclerosis really began with uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, uh, who was a 19th century French uh, uh, physician primarily focused on nervous system problems, but actually is famous for a number of different uh, uh, things that he named and discovered. But what he did is he correlated the clinical relationship to the pathological data. And he, he did basic neuropathology and uh, was the first person involved in the actual MS diagnosis in a living person. Previous to that, it would really only be made uh, pathologically. And he defined pathologically that there was demyelination, stripping of the myelin wrapping off of the cable, the axon of the nerve, as a primary abnormality that was seen pathologically. But notably, even back then, this was in 1865, even then noted that there was also a dropout and, and death of nerve cells themselves, damage to the nerve cells themselves. That was forgotten for over 100 years until it was resurrected as an idea in, uh, in the late 1990s by Bruce Trapp and others. And uh, what evolved over the course of time was a greater understanding that this was an immune pathology. That is, there were immune-based cells surrounding what we refer to as the plaques, these abnormal collection of white blood cells, macrophages, complement, and other immune mediators surrounding thin-walled veins inside the central nervous system, and then with surrounding loss of the myelin wrapping around the cables and the damage to the uh, axons as well. That understanding that this was an immune-based abnormality uh, had a fundamental effect in that it changed the way people think about the disease and changed the way people thought about trying to treat multiple sclerosis. So that was a fundamental uh, change that occurred. And, uh, and for example, the, the abnormality of spinal fluid, oligoclonal bands, was discovered roughly 60 years ago, also uh, noting this to be an immune-mediated problem. Over time, it became clear that this, however, was not just a disease of the so-called white matter. The myelin wrapping itself is sort of white-yellowish. It's primarily made up of fat and protein studded into the walls of the fat. And uh, so we've always called, and if you look up in any, any uh, textbook of neurology, they'll call MS a white matter disease or demyelinating disorder. But in reality, in the last 10 to 15 years, 20 years perhaps, there's been a lot more interest and a lot more research looking at the so-called gray matter. This is where the cells of the nerve cells, the actual body of the nerve cells, live, mostly in the outer mantle of the brain or then deep in the middle of the brain or also in the middle of the spinal cord. And it's become abundantly clear that these gray matter lesions, these gray matter plaques or changes, atrophy of the gray matter, is profoundly important and is actually highly associated with disability over time. So although we continue to call this a so-called white matter disease, the reality is the gray matter is extremely important. 
In addition, pathology as people age, especially with progressive forms of MS, has become better understood over the course of the last several years and defines that this is not just an abnormality inside the brain or the spine proper, but also in the lining of the brain, the meninges. You can see that there are these collections, see if I can do this, these collections of white blood cells, these B lymphocytes and plasma cells, actually as follicles in the lining of the brain. How exactly they're functioning, what they're doing is not well known, but they're associated to a great degree with those gray matter plaques I just showed you deep into the areas here, and you can see around these areas that that's where a lot of the gray matter lesions are, seemingly associated with these lesions in the meninges. So this is a fundamental shift. In addition, there's uh, also known to be activated uh, white blood cells, uh, microglia, that are also seen in the central nervous system. They're the resident cells of the immune system inside the nervous system. Those are profoundly activated in patients who are older with progressive forms of the MS. So the pathology perhaps shifts as people age, where when they're younger, they have those active lesions, like that first one I showed. But as they age, they have more gray matter involvement and more of this other type of involvement in the meninges. Ultimately, the pathology is now shown as well that a lot of the cells that are dropping out as people age with their MS has to do with power failure inside of cells and actually probably with oxidizing agents. So it's possible that antioxidants might be useful as a therapy for MS, and this is where a lot of the research is going. With regard to diagnostic criteria, there were no real diagnostic criteria uh, prior to the 20th century, and there are a variety of different criteria that are noted here, uh, and you can frame the different sets of criteria uh, based on where they are with relationship to the development of uh, MRI as a diagnostic tool. And in the old days, Schumacher criteria was long before MRI scans. The Poser criteria came out just as MRI scans were being uh, introduced into, uh, into our world. And then McDonald, the so-called McDonald criteria, there have been four iterations of this over the last uh, 17 or 18 years, and heavy incorporation of MRI scans into the diagnostic criteria, allowing for much more rapid and early diagnosis and with greater sensitivity and specificity. Uh, it also allowed us to introduce uh, concepts that were previously not well understood. The first would be so-called clinically isolated syndrome. That is the very first clinical attack that occurs. Uh, maybe someone has an optic neuritis or maybe a spinal cord syndrome. Um, in the old days, we just called that the first attack of maybe MS, maybe not. But now if someone has a clinically isolated syndrome, a typical MS attack, and they have lesions that look like MS, essentially they already have MS after just a single attack. In addition, even before that, radiologic isolated syndrome, someone who gets an MRI scan for some other concept, for some other reason, they had a car accident, maybe they have headaches, and yet they have a brain scan that looks very much like multiple sclerosis. Uh, and so those individuals are termed as having radiologic isolated syndrome, that is, abnormalities before they've ever even had a clinical attack. And it's notable that a significant number of these patients over time will develop clinical problems related to MS, and I'll show you a slide in a moment that might uh, help us choose those patients at highest risk of that. But also the MRI scans have allowed us to distinguish between other conditions like MS, neuromyelitis optica, and MOG antibody disease. And also the new diagnostic criteria also includes the uh, formal criteria for definition in children, which is not previously done. Going forward, looking at so-called biomarkers, that is elements in the blood, in spinal fluid, in urine, some other uh, way to more specifically and sens sensibly and early diagnose MS uh, will be extremely important. How we call MS has also evolved over time. For many years, uh, it was just uh, sort of uh, relapsing MS and what was previously called chronic progressive MS. Over time, and especially with the introduction in 1996 on the left, and then with a new iteration on the right uh, in 2013, Fred Lublin and and others have defined what we call the phenotypes of MS. And these phenotypes are just, what is the patient, how does the patient manifest? What do they have clinically? And, uh, and so on the left here, uh, this is for individuals who have relapsing forms of MS. In the old days, we just called it with full recovery or with sequelae, that is leftover deficit afterwards. But now, again, with the introduction of this concept of clinically isolated syndrome, 
uh, someone has a first attack, if it's not active, we just call it clinically isolated syndrome. If it's active, that, mean ha that means having new changes on their scan and or new relapses. That we then call it formally relapsing remitting MS, which can either be not active if they have just become stable, which can certainly occur, or active when they have, on when they have ongoing either relapses or scan changes, typically being evaluated at least annually. Similarly, by the same uh, groups, you can identify those individuals with progressive MS. In the old days, uh, oops, sorry. In the old days, um, progressive MS was just called primary progressive, those who had progression from the onset, secondary progressive, those individuals who had uh, relapses, which later trans, uh, transformed into more of a progressive mode with or without relapses, or progressive relapsing when people had both. This was defined differently, and this is relevant now because of the two new drugs that were just approved a couple weeks ago. And that's actually to think of progressive MS as either primary onset without relapses or after following relapses, but at the same time that patients could either have active disease, that is having relapses or scan changes, and or progression. This is with progression, this is without. And similarly, you can have individuals who are not active, that is not having scan changes or relapses, and they could have with progression or without progression. So not active and without progression means they have pretty much stable disease. The importance of this likely has to do with those individuals who are most likely to respond to the therapies that are presently available, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And this is just one aspect of the diagnostic criteria and the way we think about patients that is relevant to risk factors. This is from Darren Nakuda and colleagues who followed a large number of individuals with so-called radiologic isolated syndrome, no clinical attacks, but MRI scans that look like MS. And if you actually look at those patients, you can divide those individuals who are likely to have a clinical attack over the next coming one, two, five, or even longer number of years. And three factors at least stick out as relevant to risk factors for having ongoing disease activity for these people who have never had clinical activity. So either spinal cord involvement, age, or sex make a difference. So those with spinal cord involvement, those who are younger than age 37, those who are males as opposed to females have a higher risk. If you have all three of those risk factors, your, your likelihood of having an acute attack clinical attack typical of MS is extremely high in just a couple of years. Whereas if you're a older woman, older, over age 37, sorry. Um, <laughs> if you are a woman 37 plus years of age with no spinal cord involvement, your risk of having a clinical attack is actually quite low, even over a stronger number, longer number of years. So using this kind of information, it can help define those individuals who are at greater risk compared to those who are at lower risk. With regard to therapies, and you're going to have a whole talk for, about therapies from Dr. Alvarez, so I'm just going to briefly talk about large concepts. Over time, and this is over 100 plus years or longer, the concept of how to treat MS has changed dramatically. Uh, and it was really related to what was felt to be the cause of MS at that point in history. And so all of these different concepts here, uh, concepts here, MS being caused by infection, inflammation, vitamin deficiencies, vascular problems, psychiatric issues, toxins or physical uh, effects, trauma or other things, have all defined then ways that people were treated over time. But it became much uh, more clear, especially as the pathology was defined as being associated with immunologic abnormalities in the brain and spinal cord, that perhaps the best way to treat this, at least for the immune-based component of MS, would be with immunotherapies. And beginning in the 60s up through the early 90s, uh, a large number of clinical trials were done. Uh, and this was before we sort of understood this concept of the phenotypes as well. Uh, and uh, immune suppressive approaches, things that were often used for chemotherapies, cancer drugs, were used. These were generally very nonspecific drugs. They affect multiple different cell types and molecules. They had broad actions. And the studies had mixed success at, at best. They also were quite toxic. And uh, importantly, mostly they would just study any MS patient, any age, any subtype, any phenotype. And, uh, and the lack of success with these studies uh, at one point led to therapeutic nihilism. That is, people felt that it's just not worth trying to treat MS. 
But as a greater understanding of the pathology became available and the understanding of the way the molecules were intersecting inside the brain and the spine became available, more targeted therapies, less toxic therapies became available. And so this is the landscape now. And uh, Dr. Vollmer and I finished our fellowships about right there. <laughs> and uh, so it is dramatic that since our entire career has run, that we now have this broad array of different medications that are available, including uh, two just approved two weeks ago, uh, saponamod and cladribine. Uh, and so this is a dizzying array of different medications with multiple different mechanisms of action, multiple different ways that they're delivered, multiple different types of side effects, long-term risks, uh, insurance-related problems, costs, et cetera, that make choosing these medications extremely challenging. All of these different medications are immune-based. They're based on somehow altering or suppressing or modulating the immune system. And um, uh, we had March Madness uh, that culminated with Virginia winning the basketball tournament. But in a couple of days, uh, two weeks ago, we also had our own little version with two approvals in a three-day period of time. And just to mention, uh, saponamod, the trade name is Mazent, and cladribine, uh, the trade name is Mavenclad approved within a couple of days of each other, and indicated for uh, clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing MS, and active secondary progressive MS. Again, this new concept of phenotype, you have active or inactive disease, now being reflected for the first time ever in a product label from the FDA. Um, and similarly, cladribine, not approved for CIS, but approved for relapsing and active secondary progressive MS, both oral, and they have some notable differences between them, uh, the the uh, interesting part about this is that saponamod was studied primarily, if not exclusively, in active in, in secondary progressive MS. It got a label including the other portions of the phenotypes, and cladribine was really only studied in relapsing MS and got a label also to include active secondary progressive MS. And I think what this reflects is that the reality is is that all of these immune-based therapies are going to be active. In, in suppressing disease activity if there's acute inflammation that has either been recent or at least is still at uh, significant risk for that patient. In general, that tends to be the patients who are relatively uh, younger, but it could include patients uh, up to many different ages. So that's essentially what I just said right there. Um, what that begs then is a couple of different questions. If we're gonna call someone active, what does that mean? How long uh, would they have to be inactive before you'd say, you know, how long would it have to be before uh, someone didn't have a relapse or didn't have a scan change? You'd have to say, oh, that person's inactive. And that remains unclear. It also begs the question as to whether or not you can stop a disease-modifying therapy, at least the presently available ones, at some point. And uh, we and others are doing studies right now looking at that question. Is it safe to consider discontinuation of disease-modifying therapies as people age based on this concept of disease activity. So the approaches to therapy over time, though, are going to include immunotherapies, presently available disease-modifying therapies, uh, rebooting of the immune system, maybe the most extreme version of this, where you would literally re uh, remove and then replace the immune system with stem cells. Uh, the first controlled trial was, was completed uh, just recently reported just the last few months, and we're starting the BDMS stem cell study this summer uh, comparing uh, stem cell transplant to highly effective therapy. Uh, neuroprotective approaches, I alluded to those before. We might use antioxidants or approaches that might enhance cellular integrity by maintaining uh, uh, production of energy inside cells. Remyelination is being actively studied. Unfortunately, the studies so far have not shown too much. And replacement, could you replace cells? We can replace a, a shoulder, we can replace a hip or a knee. Could you replace cells inside the nervous system and so replace the damaged cells? That, this is very, very um, challenging as a concept and is not really close to uh, uh, prime time yet, but the concept uh, is the same. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on this concept of how we use the presently available medicines. This will probably be gone into a little bit more by uh, Dr. Alvarez. Uh, over the course of the last uh, 10 to 15 years with the explosion of the new medications and more of them of different levels of efficacy, safety, monitoring, et cetera, 
It has been common to have so-called escalation therapy, starting with the old tried and true me uh, medications and just escalating as needed to other therapies over time. And uh, in, the, in the dotted lines here, you could in fact think if you had really aggressive disease, you might go right to the highly effective even chemotherapy or stem cell transplants from the outset. And then perhaps discontinuing therapies over time. The stepwise approach or step editing is very common still and required by many insurance companies. But there's an alternative approach, and you'll probably hear a bit about this from uh, Dr. Vollmer as well. Uh, we feel strongly that simply waiting for someone to develop disability over time and using deliberately using less effective therapies when patients are at highest risk of having more problems is not uh, the best way to go. So the alternative therapy is someone's newly diagnosed and for the majority of individuals to use highly effective therapy, but relatively safe therapy, uh, and then potentially to continue discontinuation over time, but continuing, continually using this for a prolonged period of time. A third approach, which would be perhaps the most aggressive approach, would be to try to reboot your immune system right up front. Now this is by no means standard of care, uh, but theoretically it's uh, similar to perhaps chemotherapy induction and things like that. Uh, but the concept would be that you would perhaps use uh, uh, these therapies where you reboot the immune system very early and then either de-escalate therapy or maybe even discontinue therapy uh, over time, uh, either very early or over time later. These are all different approaches. There's no one necessarily approach that fits every single person. How this is going to work out over time and how things are managed with different medications as they become available will be the interesting uh, a part of what happens over the course of the next 10 or 15 years. So I think that is my last slide. Yep. So uh, thank you very much for coming. I uh, hope you all have an interesting day. I know I'm going to learn a lot, and I hope you guys learn a lot also. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Dr. Corboy. Dr. Corboy and our next presenter, Dr. Timothy Vollmer, are the co-directors of the Rocky Mountain. Got to give space. Rocky Mountain MS Center at the University of Colorado. Another aspect of how we care for our patients and families is part of our mission. Our MMSC doctors also provide care at Denver Health and the VA Hospital. Dr. Vollmer is the MS Center's medical director and co-director of the Rocky Mountain MS Center at the University of Colorado. He has participated in over 100 clinical studies and in MS and is currently the principal investigator on seven funded studies. Dr. Vollmer will be discussing the immunology and neurobiology of MS, implications for maximizing lifelong brain health in MS. Am I already done? Okay. All right. Sorry, folks. Just getting all wired up here at the last moment. So um, I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit more about what John started, and this is concept of maximizing lifelong brain health. Can you all hear me back there? Can you hear me? Is it on? Yeah, you might want to slide it up just a little bit. Well, stand this way. Does that work? <laughs> okay. Let me put it in the center here. Somewhere. All right. So now, can you hear me in the back? I guess not. Uh, okay. So um, the concept of maximizing lifelong brain health is something that we all should want to be, be, pay attention to. It's relevant to all, all human beings. The brain, after all, is the most human of all organs. But for people with MS, there's some additional considerations that involve immunology and neurobiology, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So these are my conflicts of interest, and if you have any questions about them, feel free to talk to me after the presentation. So as John was just telling you, our concept of MS is changing very rapidly. So we have all of these uh, subtypes here, and uh, the main point I'd like to get across to you is ignore them. You either have MS or you don't, okay? And the reason is, is that the immunology of these is essentially the same. There are variants. Some people have slightly more aggressive inflammatory disease that's more destructive. Other people have less. But the basic biology behind them seems to be the same based on clinical trials. And this concept of active MS and inactive MS over here is the key. 
And the reason for that is that the inflammatory attack on the brain is most brisk at onset. It's most brisk in early age. And onset of MS, I think, occurs in most patients in the late teens and early 20s. And that's where most of the inflammation is at. And over time, as the patient ages, the infl inflammatory attack becomes less frequent, and that impacts treatment outcomes. Simultaneously, though, as patients have MS, they're, they're losing neurons, and they're using up what we call neurological reserve. And I'll come back to neurological reserve in a little bit. But the brain is getting smaller, and the capacity of the brain to compensate for injury or to recover from injury is also declining. Okay? And it's the interaction between these two that explain the different phenotypes, progressive versus relapse and emitting, and also explains the different responses to therapies that we see. So let's talk a bit about the brain. The nervous system is made up of three components. There's the central nervous system. That includes, if I can find the man, includes the brain, the optic nerves, and the spinal cord. Then there's the peripheral nervous system, which is the nerves as they, after they exit from the spinal canal or exit the cranium. And, and go out to all the tissues. And then there's the autonomic nervous system that runs parallel to this. Now, MS is a disease of the central nervous system. And one might ask why. why what's different about the central nervous system? The main difference is the central nervous system includes a cell type called an astrocyte. And I'll come back to that. Now, the central nervous system, in terms of the number of nerve cells you have, uh, has almost all the nerve cells you're ever going to have in your life at birth. There are a few places where you can grow some new nerve cells, and the hippocampus is involved in short-term memory in the olfactory cortex. But by and large, you're born with almost all the neurons you're ever going to have. The brain, however, continues to grow up until about age 20. And that increase in brain size is mostly due to proliferation of the other key cell types in the brain, the oligodendrocytes and the astrocytes. And it also is increasing in size because those 100 billion nerve cells that you're born with are making new connections between themselves. They're making this large synaptic network. And behavior, and your ability to learn new behaviors, motor activities, literature, languages, math, all of that is a manifestation of that increasing size of that neural, neural network. So the more connections you have between your nerve cells, the better your brain performs. Now the cell types, the reason I'm going to go over the cell types is because what is usually left out of discussions about multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis are astrocytes. So in this cartoon, we have the nerve cell, the neuron, its process or nerve fiber called the axon. We have the myelin-forming cell that makes the myelin, which is the oligodendrocyte. And we have the myelin sheaths that come in segments. And then we have a blood vessel flowing through here. The cell type that's most important for our conversation today, though, are these astrocytes. Astrocytes actually are the most common cell type in the brain. They make up about 60% of the volume of the brain, and they do a tremendous number of things. Neurons, by contrast, do basically one thing. They fire. But astrocytes create a special environment in, in the brain that allows the nerve cells and the oligodendrocytes to live in a very specific environment. So they, astrocytes have these processes that go out. They're not well designed here, but anyways, they come out and they form networks. They actually engulf the nerve cell and they regulate the environment there, providing food, removing toxins, taking up neurotransmitters. They also do the same thing at these gaps in the myelin, which are called nodes of Ranvier. They surround that and control the microenvironment there in great detail. They also make a barrier, so they put out processes that actually connect and make a solid barrier outside the blood vessel to control what can leak from the blood vessel into the parenchyma of the brain. They're very important cells. And then not only that, they're part of the immune system. And in multiple sclerosis, they become an active part of the immune system. So this is a picture of resting astrocytes here. They're called astrocytes because in early histology, it looked like stars. So that's what the astro comes from. And when they get inflamed or damaged, they turn into reactive astrocytes or pro-inflammatory astrocytes, and they get big and juicy, and they begin to produce a lot of different molecules, toxic molecules like nitric oxide, tumor necrosis factor. And those molecules can come back and kill oligodendrocytes and neurons. Now, the immune system is also playing an important role here. And the point I'm trying to make here is that the immune system starts the disease, but the astrocytes may carry it on. So in the immune system, we have a large number of different cell types that are part of the immune system. But for MS purposes, we're really focused down here on the T cells and the B cells. These are the part of the immune system that actually learns from experience. 
the rest of the immune cells are pre-programmed through evolution to respond to certain molecules that they recognize as foreign. And so they're the first line of defense against infection. But the T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes are there to allow your body to actually identify new pathogens that, that evolution hasn't primed you for and allow you to develop more focus and more potent responses to them. They also help in dealing with cancer and other issues. Now, the most important cell right now in MS appears to be these B lymphocytes. <clears throat> and B lymphocytes are the part of the system that makes antibody. So when you get vaccinated for the flu, it's B cells that get activated, and they produce the antibody, and they turn into other types of cells called plasmoblasts and plasmacytes. Now, <clears throat> we all know that we have a circulatory system where the heart's pumping blood throughout the body. But there's another circulatory system that runs in parallel to that, and that's the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system are a set of, of small tubes that permeate the entire body. They basically uh, are open in tissues, and they allow fluid in the tissues to drain into them. And then they drain that, that uh, fluid through the lymph nodes, and then eventually dump it back into the circulatory system through the thoracic duct. Most of the immune system right, resides in the lymph nodes, the gut, bone marrow, skin, and uh, spleen. And so this system allows the body to survey those fluids all the time for infectious agents or cancer or other things that then activate the immune cells that are in these lymph nodes so that they can go out and respond. However, there is, was religion in the field of science, and uh, one of the religious doctrines was that the brain was special. It didn't have lymphatics, and that was because of a pathology paper written in the 1930s. And so it was thought to be an immune-privileged site. But in fact, in 2015, uh, two labs reported that they actually did identify lymphatics in the brain. They were running along the membranes, the meninges that line the brain, and they drain out into these deep cervical lymph nodes. For example. So you have lymph nodes at the base of your skull, just in front of your spinal cord, sitting at the base of the skull, called deep cervical lymph nodes. And those are connected with the brain. So when immune cells, particularly lymphocytes, get into the brain, when they cross the blood-brain barrier, one of the ways they leave the brain is to flow out through those lymphatics down into that deep cervical lymph node. So we know that B cells are involved in MS because the most effective therapies we have specifically block B cells from getting into the brain. And so it was hypothesized that maybe those B cells might be coming from those deep cervical lymph nodes. And in fact, there is good evidence that they are. A group at Yale did a genetic study using deep sequencing where they could look at the B lymphocytes specifically and they could show that the B lymphocytes in the brain were closely related to the B lymphocytes in those deep cervical lymph nodes. They were part of the same family. They were responding to the same antigen. And <clears throat> there were more members of the family in the deep cervical lymph node than there were in the brain, suggesting that the deep cervical lymph node was providing the brain those lymphocytes. Now, if you think about that, I've just told you a very important uh, point about our therapies and how lucky we are. So, Natalizumab or Tasabri works by blocking the ability of lymphocytes to cross into the brain. But that means that these lymphocytes from these deep cervical lymph nodes have to go through the lymphatics, re-enter the circulation through the thoracic duct, circulate back to the brain, and then cross the blood-brain barrier to cause inflammation. And just by luck, we developed a therapy called Tasabri that blocks their ability to get across that blood-brain barrier. And it's one of the most effective therapies we have. Another one of the highly effective therapies we have are the anti-CD20s. This is rituximab and ocalizumab. And just by luck, not, we didn't predict this, we didn't anticipate it, but by luck, we arrived at a dose of those drugs that's highly effective in MS, but is too low of a dose to kill the, the B cells that are in the spleen and lymph node in the other tissues, but it does kill the B cells that are in the circulation. So we're just catching those B cells that are leaving those deep cervical lymph nodes uh, when they enter the bloodstream, and we're killing them before they get a chance to get to the brain and cross the blood-brain barrier. And those are two of our most effective therapies in the right patients, also some of the most uh, safe therapies we have. So this immunology is interacting with those astrocytes that I was talking about earlier. And so uh, we, we have the lymph sites in the circulation that come from the deep cervical lymph nodes. They cross the blood-brain barrier. They recognize something in the brain. We don't know what that something is, but they become activated. They then produce molecules, cytokines and other molecules, that cause resting astrocytes to turn into these activated pro-inflammatory astrocytes, which are producing noxious molecules that damage oligodendrocytes, and if I just go over here, also neurons. So it's, as John mentioned, MS is not a disease of myelin. It's a disease of the central nervous system. And actually damage to the neurons is the most powerful predictor of disability. 
So we have this sort of vicious cycle going on where these astrocytes are also promoting these B-cell T-cell interactions, and B-cell T-cell interactions are promoting this, and it creates a, a field of these activated astrocytes that basically kills all the oligodendrocytes in that field and will eventually damage a lot of the nerve fibers and, and also lead to death of neurons. Now, astrocytes, though, can be pushed in a different direction. They can be pushed in a direction to become neuroprotective. And, in fact, we have some evidence that some of the therapies that we used that we thought we were using because they affected lymphocytes actually may be working at the level of astrocytes. And this is Gelenia, Mazent, and Tecfidera. And so there's a signaling pathway called the NF-kappa B signaling pathway that promotes this activity, and these drugs block that signaling pathway. And there's some evidence that they push them back into a resting astrocyte that now is focused on producing neurotrophins and other molecules that help nerve cells proliferate, or at least make new connections and grow and helps oligodendrocytes survive. So I would argue that the next major area of, of investigation for us is actually, if I can just find the cursor here, is actually this process here. It's trying to inhibit these pro-inflammatory astrocytes and trying to promote astrocytes down the line of being neuroprotective and reparative in nature. And we have, already have drugs and things that can do that. So the way that these, these modifying therapies work, this is my view of it. We have the general immunosuppressants, as uh, John's already mentioned. They basically just suppress the immune system one way or another. Most of these are genotoxic drugs, omtuzumab is an antibody that's complicated in the way that it works. Then we have drugs that seem to be working primarily by inhibiting cells, the lymphocytes from getting into the brain. That includes all the interferons and uh, tisabri. We have one cell, one drug that I think works primarily by inducing regulatory B cells that enter the brain and turn down inflammation, and that's Copaxone. I think this has been a really a missed opportunity by the scientific community. I'm not paying more attention to this. And then we have the NC20s that seem to kill the B cells in the blood. And then we have these oral medications that I think are not so much working by suppressing the immune attack, but actually are working because they penetrate the blood-brain barrier and they're inhibiting <coughs> the activation of these pro-inflammatory uh, astrocytes. So the future, and the future is, I think, neuroprotection. And we have these remyelinating therapies that are over here, uh, biotin, opacinumab. But we actually have quite a few therapies that are potentially neuroprotective therapies, including statins, such as Lipitor and other medications. And so our hope is that we can begin to initiate trials for patients who have more aggressive MS or more symptoms from MS, where they're on one of the NC20s or natalizumab, and then we add these therapies onto them to try to get a bigger effect. Because natalizumab and the NC20s do not affect astrocytes. They don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So we think combining a therapy that shuts off those pro-inflammatory astrocytes and stops the immune attack on the brain from the lymphocytes might be a more effective therapy than what we currently have. So to finish up here, to get back to the concept of brain reserve. So this is an MS brain, and um, it has the typical white matter lesions that can be black holes on other sequences, and these represent loss of nerve fibers and neurons. But also, the brain is much smaller than it should be by virtue of the size of the lateral ventricles and the space in between the soul side. And it's just this, this loss of brain volume represents loss of neurons. So the number of neurons you have determines how big your brain is going to be. So neurologic reserve, again, it's just a concept. It's just a way for us to talk about the ability of the brain to compensate for injury and also to recover from injury. And there are two major components to neurologic reserve. There's a biological one that's referred to as brain reserve, and that's just your genetics, you know, how you were uh, pre-programmed to generate neurons and connect them. The other one is called active reserve, and that's the one that you have control over. Active reserve uh, refers to the part of the capacity of the brain to compensate for injury that you induce by making more connections between your nerve cells. You do that by exercise, by learning, by being socially active, by playing games, probably not by watching TV, but at least pretty much everything else. The point is, living an active, healthy lifestyle, both physically and intellectually, increases the size of your neural network, and that gives your brain more ways to shift function around as we lose neurons, all of us and particularly for MS patients. In fact, if we can get patients that on MS on highly effective therapies in the early phase of the disease where they have fatigue and some neuropathic pain and some numbness and tingling and get them to exercise, all of those symptoms can resolve. And it's not uncommon for them to come back at a year or two and tell us they don't feel like they have MS anymore. 
In fact, 60% of my patients don't have any reason to come in and see me except for me to do the blood test. They're doing fine, they're doing great. So where we're at right now in MS is remarkable. And using these therapies and, and help patients to adopt an active, healthy lifestyle is very therapeutically powerful. So to summarize here, uh, we have this relapsing phase of the disease. Sometimes it's clinically apparent, sometimes it's not. Again, 90 to 95% of new lesions on MRI are not associated with symptoms, but they are damaging the brain, and the brain is shrinking at an accelerated rate. That's using up that neurological reserve, and eventually it is used up, and I think that's when people move into the progressive phase of the disease. And two things happen here. One is um, patients in that phase their brains don't have that much ability to repair themselves, so recovery function is much more difficult in this phase. The second thing that happens is we've unmasked the effect of aging on the brain. And so even if we shut off the MS process, patients will continue to slowly worsen just because of aging effects. So we want to treat as early as we possibly can and diagnose as early as we possibly can. And Dr. Corboy and Dr. Schreiner have studies trying to help us diagnose in a much earlier phase of the disease. So maximizing lifelong brain health involves uh, diagnosing MS as early as possible. It involves initiating highly effective therapies as early as possible, as John showed. It involves developing and maintaining a lifelong moderate exercise program. Moderate, doesn't have to be extreme. It means staying intellectually, socially, and emotionally active. And it means eating a healthy diet to prevent diet-related diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, or obesity, because these also use up your neurological reserve. So by adopting this comprehensive approach to management of MS, you can maximize your function, and you can maximize your late life function, and you can be the grandparents you always wanted to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vollmer. At this time, we will be taking a 15-minute break. Please take time to visit the tables in the lobby, enjoy refreshments, chat, fill out your evaluations, and enjoy yourselves. If you're having trouble thinking of what to say to your table mate, I want to draw your attention to the slips of paper in front of you. These are ideas and questions that we hope will be fun kickstarters for your conversations. And be sure to give our volunteers any note cards with questions for the presenters so far. We will reconvene at 10.05. Thank you.
Hello. As we return from break, I'd like to take a quick opportunity to thank a special group of volunteers with us today. Many of the people helping today run smoothly are from Pima Medical Institute. Can you, all of the volunteers please stand and raise your hands? These folks are also the ones collecting your questions, so please be sure to keep submitting those. We really appreciate all that you are doing today. Pima also volunteers with KDEP, our adult day program. We rely on hundreds of volunteers a year, and anyone can get involved. Volunteers help us with valuable services in a variety of different ways all throughout the year. Our hydrotherapy program, our young professionals network, our adult day program, and with our special events. If you are interested in volunteering with our program, please visit our information table in the back of this room or talk with Sarah, our volunteer manager. I would now like to introduce and welcome Dr. Enrique Alvarez to the podium. Dr. Alvarez is the clinic director at the Rocky Mountain MS Center at CU. His research interests include projects on retrospective chart reviews, examining how patients have done in clinical, the clinic outside of clinical trials to better understand how patients have done with their various treatments. Dr. Alvarez is presenting on a plethora of DMTs, how do we use them? Perfect. All right, perfect. These are my disclosures. So I'm going to try and take you back to kind of when you first got diagnosed and came into the clinic and try to say, like, what are the things that we're thinking about, how much we're telling you, the stuff we're keeping secret from you, um, <laughs> in order to try and figure out what drug to pick for you guys, um, you know, and hopefully make a decision with you. Um, as we start to look at that. So I think you've seen different representations of things like this where you can see a lot of different drugs. It's the beauty that we have now currently in MS that we have a ton of options that we can go with as far as being able to treat you. I think that you, you've seen things like the first drug being around in 93. I'm losing the pointer. Anyway, early on in 93. Um, and then the, the, the two latest options that we've got. But we have a lot of options. You can tell a little bit by the colors. So blue being pills. Uh, those start about the time where I came into MS field. So that's when I started my fellowship in 2010. You have injections in green. You have in yellow infusions. Uh, so you have different ways to dose these, how frequently you do them. Um, and things like that that I think are great benefits uh, for some people versus other people. Some people prefer to stay away from an infusion center and just take a, pay, uh, a pill daily or something like that. Some people are going to instead go for an infusion where they don't have to worry about taking a pill and they can just come in and just be you know, done with it, kind of in a sense. And so I think there's different options for different people that fit into different people's lifestyle a little bit better. So how do we pick between these drugs? Well, before I get into that, I do have to introduce kind of the new guys on the block. Uh, Dr. Uh, Corboy already kind of introduced some of these earlier. Um, but I'll give you sort of my quick take on them. The, they're, they're soon to be available, so they're approved. They're going through all the hoops that they need to in order to get approved. Um, and so I think of saponamide a little bit as Jelenia. Uh, so if you look at the very top here, you can see that uh, Jelenia has to get phosphorylated. It has to have a chemical change to it so that it can become active. Once it does that, there's a family of five different targets or receptors that it can attach to to have its effects. And they're out of order, so one, five, four, and three. Um, versus saponimod has a little bit more selectivity in that it only attacks two of these or affects two of these, uh, one and five. And so even though Jelenia got looked at as far as being able to reduce relapses, the big trial uh, for saponamod really has the primary endpoint looking at disease progression. And so this is a little bit of a different concept. And so we tend to think of the drug, at least in terms here, about it being kind of a bit of a progressive drug. The indication really kind of highlighted it as an uh, inflammatory drug with having an effect on, uh, on active disease. Uh, and I'll put my two cents into the, the criteria. I still am trying to figure out what progressive, not active, not progressing category really means. So uh, I guess 
stable is still progressive, so for whatever that's worth. Um, so a lot of the same side effects that we see with saponamide are going to be very similar to the side effects that you're going to think about with saponamide, uh, with gelenia, sorry. And so the, the main difference is that with that first dose observation, the six-hour monitoring, so we've been able to kind of, or, or Novartis was able to kind of be able to kind of work around it by doing a titration. So instead of having to have that first dose observed for most patients, we can get around that by simply just kind of starting a little bit of the dose and then kind of wrapping up. And so that would be a nice, uh, you know, kind of way to start as opposed to having to kind of try to figure out how to do the six-hour observation. So that's great. Um, we still have to, we still see cases of macular edema. We still have a little bit of the cardiac issues. That QT prolongation just means that there's a little bit of a delay in the signal as it goes through the heart. Um, we still worry about infections, not much in the clinical trial, but most of these things were things that we saw in the long term, so we're going to have to kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, liver toxicity, we talk about, we hardly ever really see. It tends to be really slow. As long as we do the blood works, uh, as Dr. Vollmer said, most of the times we're just kind of doing there the safety labs, and that's why we're hopefully just kind of catching you in clinic, is to make sure that none of this stuff happens. The number one thing that we tend to see from the clinical trials with these drugs are headaches. Not something we see in clinic very often, um, but it's one of those things that in the trials, I guess people get headaches, and they happen to be in that side of the drug arm, and they get noted as having headache as a side effect of the drug. But we do see, you know, for example, probably more people stopping things like gelenia because of uh, GI stuff or things like that than even headaches. So sometimes the clinical trial data is a little bit different from the real world data. And those are the things that we try and keep in mind as we're looking at it. So how effective of a drug is it? So on the preventing disability, we see that there is a slight difference between it and progressive disease. Um, and this is looking at progress, uh, disability accumulation or stability of that disability over three months. The one on the right side is over six months. And you can see that there's uh, an advantage over patients treated with, with placebo. Uh, so I think this is, uh, you know, we, an, an interesting addition to, uh, to the drugs that we use. And I think partly we're going to have to figure out, are we going to use it for active patients? Are we going to use it more as a progressive type of a drug, even to maybe it did not get included in patients that are no longer active. Uh, and part of that had to be because the patients that went into the clinical trial had to have some disease activity two years prior uh, starting that study. And so I think that that's a little bit kind of where they felt uh, the need to indicate that active, secondary, progressive. All right, so if we look at cladribine or maven clad, um, this is another uh, pill that... Uh, that just got approved. This was a medicine that, as I pointed out, I started my fellowship in 2010, and Jelenia was in a fight with Mavenclad to see who was going to come out first, uh, and we finally got it. So a little bit delayed. Uh, and the main issue really was concern about cancers. A lot of follow-up studies have not really shown an increase in cancers, but it still carries a, uh, a box warning as far as concern for that. The way the drug works is the drug gets into the cells. It becomes activated within certain types of cells. And particularly the cells where it becomes activated are those immune cells, those lymphocytes that Dr. Vollmer was talking about. Once it's active, it can insert itself into DNA, which is, I think, the concern primarily, and then inhibit how fast some cells can divide. And particularly, and so some of the selectivity comes in because those enzymes that activate it tend to be primarily in those lymphocytes. Uh, however, one of the nice things about the drug is that these are all the pills that you will take in the first two years and really without any treatment after that. So you take in week one on day one, and these numbers vary a little bit depending on weight, uh, but basically... This is your year one pills, uh, week one, and then in week five, you kind of redo the same thing in the second year, and that's it. So this is that strategy that we talk a little bit about induction. We'll show this a little bit on a cartoon a little bit later. But it's really convenient, I think, to kind of think about it as you do this and you're done. The question comes up as to how effective do we think that drug is, uh, and I think 
you know, for us, and at least in my interpretation of it, this kind of falls into that middle tier of most of the or other oral pills. And so I like it in the sense that um, seven out of 10 patients will remain relapse. Uh, let me go back to at two years, four out of five are free of relapses. The concern that I have is that that number drops down to seven out of eight by four years. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it changes the immune system in such a way that you're kind of done so that you don't have to think about it after years three or years four. There's going to be a number of patients that the immune system starts to change back and they continue to have some disease activity. Um, and how do we deal with that? Do we wait for you to have another attack and then continue, you know, give you some repeat the courses above? Do we switch you out to a different medication? Uh, those kinds of things. And so those, those are things that make me a little bit nervous about using this medicine, but I like that concept of, you know, if you could change the immune system right away from the beginning and just be done with it, that'd be fabulous, right? Uh, as far as the effect on relapses, why I say for me it's kind of a middle tier type drug is that the, the relapse reduction for it is in that 58% range um, over two years. So, to kind of start deciding between drugs, um, the stuff I've been focusing on a little bit is looking at our real world data and, um, and trying to kind of look at what has been our experience of using the drugs that we primarily use in our clinic. And so, you know, to some extent we talk about risk benefits. I sometimes like to think about it as more of the risks of the drug versus the risks of not treating disease. Um, because I think it puts it a little bit more on an even keel kind of a comparison. And so these are probably the four most common drugs that we've used in the clinic, rituximab, Tisabri, Jelenia, and Tecfidera. And we can look at a number of different things. So we can look at things like clinical relapses, attacks, bouts, exacerbations, however we want to call them. Uh, but these are kind of the clinical events. We have then uh, a way to look at it using MRI lesions. So we can look at active lesions on MRI if you get the contrast material. We can look at lesions that pop up on MRIs compared to a prior MRI, so new lesions. T2 is the type of MRI sequence that, we'd let, that we like to look at for these kinds of lesions. And then we can provide composites and look at sort of a combination if you meet any one of these things. Um, you know, how you do overall. And I think we see differences, primarily that base sort of how we tend to and change sort of how we think about drugs and how we pick drugs. Um, so the infusibles tend to be the, the two um, on the left side as you look at the screen, the yellow and the blue. Um, not much in the difference between rituximab and tisabri on clinical relapses. We do see a little bit of difference in contrast enhancing lesions between these new T2 lesions, and then that's going to drive sort of this composite measure. But you can see that the orals are even higher than that. And so for us, they do separate out between the drugs themselves. One of the, the things that we commonly will hear about when we go to meetings is like, hey, there's all these drugs out there, and there's really no difference between them as far as efficacy. Well, we would say that at two years, in our experience, that there is a difference. Um, part of why they'll say that is we don't see a difference in disability maybe in 15 or 20 years. I get that, but I don't have a crystal ball to look at these outcomes You know, 20 years from when they came out, because most of the pills, that first pill came out in 2010. So we're starting to kind of get data at nine years from when those patients got started initially with Gelidia the ones that started right away. And so we will have to kind of keep looking at these drugs and try to evaluate that. Um, but we can, I think, clearly say that, you know, at, at five, 10 years, that the number of wheelchairs that we see in clinic has dramatically decreased. Uh, and the number of days where we tend to see people that have very little disability is really pretty high. Uh, and I completely second what Dr. Vollmer was saying, that you know we go through days where we see a lot of patients who are coming in for their safety lab checks. Um, and I don't want to advertise this too early, but I guess this is maybe a good forum for that, is that you know we are trying to kind of start home televisits. Uh, so more to come on that. Uh, this is going to get a little bit restricted by different types of insurances, but hopefully it gets a little bit wider spread. We're gearing up for it, and I think we should be able to get these started for some patients maybe as early as next month. 
So, um, so we'll see from that and try to even reduce the ch you know, how often you have to come into clinic. So anyway, so we can look at activity and how good they are on the benefit side of things. The risk side of things gets a little bit messier. All right, so there'll be a quiz at this on the end of the day. I was told this slide was too busy. The main points for this is that there's a lot of different things that we look at the risk side of things in clinic that we could really spend a lot of time discussing with you, you know, during an appointment for each drug. We could probably come up with a list that looked just like this of all the things that we could see and that sometimes we're still kind of wondering, like, did somebody who had pancreatitis on this drug, is that really related to the drug or not? We don't know. Was it just luck or coincidence or those kinds of things? But what this allows us to kind of try to say is start collecting data on a lot of patients for certain drugs. This is just for rituximab. And try to say, like, you know, do we need to worry about this? Is this something that's common? Is this, you know, something... That's bad. And so what we try to kind of simplify things a little bit is trying to say we're looking for things that are either bad, even if they don't happen very often, cancer, for example, PML, brain infections that might kill you, or things that happen very commonly that might be minor. So we might talk about infusion reactions or things like this so that we can give you the heads up if, hey, you're going to come into this infusion day. The first one is probably going to suck a little bit. You'll probably get some rashes. You're going to get itchy. You might get a scratchy throat. That's, that's common. But don't worry. The nurses up there at the infusion center know what to do with it. Don't worry about it. It's going to happen. You're going to get more medicine. They might slow down your infusion and expect to be there all day. But then at least you know what you're expecting, right? And so that's why we try and kind of get some data on trying to be able to say these are the things to kind of expect and what it is. When we tend to see things like infections associated with neutropenia, so we have white cells called lymphocytes, you've got neutrophils, you've got different types of cells. We've seen a couple of cases where the neutrophils might go low. And so most of these patients have done well. They've had to maybe get into the hospital. We may not mention some of these things in clinic that often because we want to be able to do some, you know, similar justice to a number of different drugs. And so this becomes that the concern that we can look at. And so we can look at a lot of different things. So how do we weigh all these things? Well, part of that is trying to understand how active patients are during disease, right? So if you're going to have a lot of disease activity, we might want to be more aggressive. If you're not going to be that active, maybe we back off. And so one of the things that we have as the best marker of how active you're going to be during disease is age. No fancy blood tests, nothing on MRI. How old are you is going to tell us probably about as much as a lot of those other things are. So early on, the, the chances of having an attack is almost one a year. By the time you're age 60, it's about one in about 10 years. Or if you want to think about it as a tenth of a chance of a one one-tenth of an attack per year, however which way you want to think about it, conceptualize it. But it goes from, you know, down to a tenth the risk as when you get early diagnosed, okay? And so you've already been introduced to this, so escalation therapy kind of looks like this. It's probably not going to work at the beginning, and at the end you end up on the high-risk drugs when you probably don't need them. We can look at induction therapy. So this is a little bit like the Maven clads, Lemtrada, things like this. You start with a hard you know, with a, with a medication that has high efficacy, you kind of kill the immune system, you change that immune system, you do something to it. And the idea, hopefully, is that that changes the immune system enough that you never get any disease activity. And then we introduce this topic that sometimes you need some things you, you break through, and that's about a third of patients on either Lemtrot or Mavenclad, and so then you need something else, and maybe you need to start a maintenance therapy to that. The other approach that we talk about is de-escalation. So this is the idea of you start heavy and somehow you can kind of adjust down and maybe, you know, take on, um, you know, less risk with drugs that maybe aren't as strong. Uh, the problem with this is we don't know when you can do that safely, right? So we don't have, again, that exact marker to say, oh, it looks like you're kind of, your risk went down enough that I think we can switch you out to this other drug. And so I think some of these approaches for different people, we have to adjust if, if other things point that you're going to be very aggressive. For sure, we want to have a medication that's going to be uh, high efficacy. If later on, you know, if you're presenting with a couple of little lesions or something like this, maybe we can start with something that's a little bit milder 
or kind of de-escalate you a little bit sooner or things like that. So this becomes, you know, some people want to be more aggressive in how they approach their disease. Some people want to be more conservative as far as that goes. And so I think that becomes a discussion that we try to have. So how do we switch between drugs? So I think it's important to kind of understand how drugs are, you know, affect you in the body and, and how we can think about them. So when you take a pill kind of at the beginning, the part in blue is sort of like how long does it take for that drug to get to where it needs to do, have its effects, those kinds of things. And so that's that little time. Some drugs that's going to be longer because it might take longer for that drug to take effect or not. Um, then there's a period of time where that drug is sort of in a range that the drug is effective. And then you have a time range where that drug just wears out. Well, ideally, oh, and then some drugs have a little bit of a difference between sort of the effect that it has on the immune system versus when the drug wears out of you. So, for example, things like rituximab deplete the B cells. That drug comes on and gets washed off of, out of your system, but those B cells take a while to come back. We call that sort of the difference between pharmacokinetics, like what the drug is doing in your system, versus can, the dynamics, sort of what, how long the body's kind of changed after that drug. And so some drugs have a dissociation between that or a difference. And so the drug's kind of still doing that same curve, but the dash line then represents the effect of the drug, which is much longer. We look at things like rituximab, we can do this. So in this early trial that, uh, that uh, involved rituximab, Basically, these patients got treated early and nothing for a year. And you can see that that effect of the drug lasts a whole year, but the drug probably is out of the system within two, three months. Why do I bring this one up? Because this is kind of using a little bit of the strategy that we're dealing with around pregnancy. Conveniently, drug wears out after three months. You've got nine months after that that we know things work out. So it was a very well-designed pregnancy test as we understand it. Um, so when we switch drugs... The idea is to try and have a drug wear off by the time the new drug starts. So we want to start the second drug by the time that second one dry, uh, starts up. We look at drugs sometimes if we start them too close together, where we worry too much about too much immunosuppression. If we space them too far apart, there's a gap in between the two drugs where you're not being covered. And unfortunately, this is probably where we're at most of the time nowadays. So an overview, one of the concepts that we try to get at is this issue um, of sort of our point of view versus, for example, things that are still in the literature that just came out with new CMSC practical guidelines for DMT selection of NIDA, no evidence of disease activity, is an unrealistic treatment goal. I struggle with that tremendously because if we're kind of up front and saying that we're never going to achieve that, you're not going to have any disease activity, uh, call me out. You know, like we're done. If we're starting there, it's like we're setting up ourselves for failure. We have drugs that can reach that 96% of the time. So I got no problems in trying to try and get to that point. When we look at the drugs, we use a lot of information. The numbers don't matter. But there's a lot of different things that we put into to try and help choose those drugs. And some drugs are going to be more, you know, are going to be things higher on your list than on other lists. Convenience of use versus how effective the drug is, those kinds of things. So the important takeaway point is, look, you have to have a discussion and how you pick your drugs, you know, will matter on this. We have to be able to compare the safety, the magnitude of the risk with patients. We have to look at the tolerability. So, you know, if you're on a drug and you're not tolerating it, well, that's no good, right? So let, we have options. Let's switch you. And then costs. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, but you can see that these things are expensive. And so sometimes we have to be able to kind of compare these drugs on these different things. All right. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez. Another aspect of the RMMSC mission is support. We provide counseling and referral services, social security disability law consultations, MS identification cards, a robust hydrotherapy program, and an MS professionals network to support patients and families. As participants in this education summit, you're already familiar with one of the programs we offer for education. We also have MS 101 classes, Conversations on MS, our quarterly publication, Informs Magazine, our monthly email newsletter, EMS News, and webinars. If you'd like information on any of these programs or services, please talk with Alyssa at the information table in the back of this room during a break.
Holly Pren is a registered dietitian and a national board certified health and wellness coach. She works in pulmonary and cardiac rehab, integrative medicine, and using the using of diet in epilepsy clinics here at the UC Health. She also works with the Rocky Mountain MS Center's wellness pilot program. She is a proponent of using food as medicine and is currently working toward a degree in culinary arts. Holly will be presenting on nutrition in MS and the truth about vitamins and supplements. Thank you so much for having me here today to speak with you. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about diet and multiple sclerosis. As a dietitian, I really think that diet is one of the main places to start. Um, I also do believe in the use of supplements, but I don't think that you can overcome a poor diet by using capsules of vitamins and minerals and herbs um, to undo what a bad diet does. There's a quote that I like to refer to that I once heard that says, it's not the beta carotene, it's the carrot. And I think that sums up a lot of how I feel about it, that you can't take a capsule and get the vitamins or the combination of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and all of that that you can in whole foods. <clears throat> so I think that's a good way to help keep that in mind. At this point, we don't have evidence that a single diet can cure or prevent multiple sclerosis, but good nutrition is still important because um, it can have a positive impact on symptoms and it can also lower the risk of developing other diseases and disorders. So vascular disease risk factors, and I think Dr. Vollmer talked a little bit about this, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, can all play a role in disability progression, and those are diseases that are common in people with multiple sclerosis. So in a way, following a healthy diet can help prevent those, which can help um, pre have the potential to affect disability progression in multiple sclerosis. So at this point, there's not any one diet prescription for multiple sclerosis that we recommend. And the reason for that is it can be really tough to come up with those general recommendations. Um, it takes a lot of research, and it also it can be tough to tease out um, causation between diet and the outcomes, especially in a disease with like multiple sclerosis where um, it affects everybody differently and where the disease doesn't necessarily follow a specific um, course. Uh, uh, that being said, a few diets that we recommend could be the uh, Mediterranean diet, the US 2015 Dietary Guidelines, or the DASH, or the Dietary Approaches for Stopping Hypertension Diet. Those would all be healthy diets to still follow. Uh, since many people do have heard of her, I do like to mention Dr. Terry Walls, since she has done a lot of um, work with diet and multiple sclerosis. There is a recent um, publication that she had put out that had shown um, in research that she had seen positive improvements with her kind of more intensive diet. Uh, the things that I like to point out about that is that a lot of people had a struggle actually sticking with it for the three month time frame of the study. And she did also note that it would likely increase grocery costs significantly. So kind of pros and cons to that. There's a recent article in neurology that found that people following a healthy diet, so kind of like those three that I talked about, um, that's high in vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, that's low in sugar, that's low in red meat, can um, as, as opposed to a less healthy diet, gave lower odds of people having higher PDDS scores. So kind of that overall healthy diet still showed some, some beneficial improvements. Uh, so kind of to sum up the diet piece before we move to supplements, I like to think of food as fuel for what you want to do in your day. So if you're fueling your body well with healthy foods that give you energy and vitamins and minerals, then you can kind of optimize the, um, your brain health, your body health, Whereas if you're fueling with kind of nutrient devoid junk foods, with refined products, um, or if you're skipping meals altogether, then you can't really expect to have the optimal health for you. 
So before, I want to start on supplementation, but before I get into kind of the array of supplements that's out there, I want to go over a few things that I want everybody to remember when they're taking supplements into consideration. So those ones are the type of evidence um, that you're looking at when you decide to take a supplement, uh, the regulation or kind of current lack thereof in the supplement industry, the potential safety concerns of any given supplement you might be considering, and then also the supplement and medication interactions. So I'm going to go through each of those kind of separately. So as far as evidence goes, there's kind of a, a number of different types of evidence. So some people I know take a supplement because they heard a story about somebody that took a supplement and got a benefit. Um, some some people heard of a friend or a friend of a friend that took a supplement and got a benefit, and we call that anecdotal evidence, and it's really not the best type of evidence to decide if something is going to be safe or effective for you. There's also, i got the little picture of the mouse, there's animal studies, so there are animal models that are similar to MS, um, but that can be a good place to start in looking at supplement research, but it's not animals can respond very differently um, and react differently to supplements than humans, so it's not necessarily a good place to decide whether or not you want to take a supplement based on what it showed in rats or rabbits or something like that. The best evidence is going to be coming from clinical trials, but even then it can vary in um, the methods they use, and then the size of the study also makes a big difference as far as how um, useful that study is to tell you how safe and effective a medication is, or sorry, a um, supplement is. So the best evidence is going to come from well-controlled clinical trials using large groups of people. So that's what we want to look for um, in the research. I do like to speak a little bit to the supplement industry regulation. So right now in the US, supplements are not regulated in the same way as, as medications. So it's not nearly as rigorous of a process. Um, the, this is all based on the DSHEA, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, um, which they basically decided that manufacturers and distributors of dietary supplements are the ones who are supposed to not sell adulterated or misbranded products. Um, however, these companies are not required to show any data on efficacy or on safety before bringing their product to the market. So the FDA really only um, can take action against companies after the product has gone to the market. So there's not a lot of kind of preemptive looking at safety. Um, oops, sorry. More on this one. I do want to point out, so in February of this year, so 25 years after the DSHEA initially came out, FDA has put out a statement, and I'm pretty excited about this. They haven't um, gotten a lot into the steps they're going to take, but they have said that they intend to strengthen regulation of the dietary supplement industry. They want to modernize and reform FDA's oversight. Uh, so part of what they said is that in the 25 years since DSHEA passed, um, the industry has grown from a $4 billion industry with 4,000 products to a $40 billion industry with over 50,000 products. And as part of that, they acknowledge that there has been with that growth, um, a number of entities marketing potentially dangerous supplements or making unproven or misleading claims about the supplements that they have, and that there's been dangers to the consumer created from this because of the number of products that are spiked with drug ingredients or that have misleading claims or that carry other risks. So they're kind of acknowledging the danger. They've said that their priorities are to ensure safety and protect consumers to uh, maintain product integrity, and to foster an environment of informed decision making. And so they're going to be providing additional details, so I don't know exactly what their plan is. Um, but I think that's pretty exciting because I think there are some benefits to taking supplements, and knowing that the supplements you're taking are safe and effective for you could mean a lot. So at this point, it's still up to you as the consumer to choose supplements from companies that are reputable manufacturers. Um, one recommendation is to look for the USP or the United States Pharmacopeia designation that um, implies that the product is uh, claimed amount, absorbable, and free from impurities. So that can be one thing at this point that can help guide you to look for better supplements. Um, 
I do like to talk a little bit about natural versus safe. I think sometimes just because it's not a medication, people think, okay, it's a supplement, it's natural, it's going to be safe. And that's not really always the case. Um, one example I have of this that you guys might have heard of, there was the medication or the supplement ephedra, um, which was, I mean, it's, it's a shrub, so it's a natural product. It's found in Asia and Mongolia. It was used for colds and fevers and things like that for a long time. Um, and they used to use it in the U.S. as a weight loss aid, but found that it caused heart problems and risk of death. So natural product, not safe. So be cautious that just because it's a supplement, just because it's not, you know, behind a pharmacy counter doesn't mean take all you want or don't look into it. And then lastly, I do want people to be aware of supplement medication interactions. Um, some herbs, vitamins, and other dietary supplements can affect how your medications work. So they can affect its absorption, um, metabolism, and action. So sometimes this makes your medications more active. Sometimes it'll make them less active than you want them to. And sometimes it can have other effects in combination with medications. So it's really important to always let your doctor and your pharmacist know what supplements you're taking so that they can do their best to help you avoid those interactions. We have access to databases through the hospital that, you know, it's tougher to get access to um, just in general. So those can really help us say, hey, this might be a good idea or a bad idea, depending on the medications you're on. So now I want to get into the possible benefits of some supplements. So um, the main article that I used to look at this is from the Journal of the American Medical Association Neurology. They published a review um, towards the end of last year that looked at the evidence of vitamins and dietary supplements for multiple sclerosis. And it took an in-depth look at uh, individual supplements and its use in multiple sclerosis. So I kind of want to summarize what that said. Um, I'm not going to delve into, there's a few things I'm not going to touch on that the article did. Um, I'm not going to touch on what uh, the studies were that showed benefit in animal models, because as I said, that's kind of preliminary. So animals react differently than humans. So I'm not going to touch on that. Um, I mainly want to focus on not just the markers of disease as well, but on the actual clinical improvements and the, the supplements that showed some potential benefits there. Um, and I'm also not going to touch on um, diet, or diet and supplements and risk of developing multiple sclerosis, because that's a whole other area of research that's really interesting, but a little off topic from today. Uh, so it is worth noting that in their conclusions of the article, they stated that at the present time, the only vitamin with sufficient evidence to support routine clinical supplementation remains vitamin D. So. That's where I'm going to start with this. <clears throat> so the evidence behind vitamin D is that the, in a study of 229 patients with relapsing remitting MS, supplementation with cholecalciferol, which is just another name for vitamin D, at 14,000 IUs a day gave a 32% reduction in new lesions detected by MRI. It didn't show effect on relapses or progression of disability. In another study of 129 patients with relapsing or emitting MS, supplementation with 100,000 IUs twice monthly showed negative results based on intention to treat, but did show reductions in relapses and in new lesions detected by MRI. So there are larger studies of vitamin D that are ongoing. And I do want to, um, so I have this on most of these supplement slides. Um, UL is tolerable upper intake level, and that's basically the amount that is um, like safe with no risk of over supplementation. Um, so for vitamin D, that's 4,000 IUs a day. If you're over supplementing, toxic effects can include hypercalcemia, cardiac arrhythmias, kidney stones. So those would be things where if you're ever taking more than that tolerable upper intake level, you just want to make sure your physician is on board and aware of what you're doing. Uh, another one that seemed very promising is biotin. So there was an open-label pilot study of 23 patients with progressive MS, and more than 90% of those patients exhibited some degree of clinical improvement. So they then did a 12-month multi-center randomized controlled trial of 154 patients um, with progressive MS and compared biotin to placebo. And the biotin arm had an improvement of motor scores of 12.6% compared to nobody in the placebo arm had any improvements. Um, they are doing a larger 
double-blind multi-center phase three randomized control, controlled trial to show proof of that beneficial effect. And one of the things that I thought was good about biotin is there's not a tolerable upper intake level um, and there's no toxic effects um, that are reported. Vitamin A is another one that seemed very promising from the research. So there was a randomized controlled trial of 101 patients that reported use of vitamin A at 25,000 IUs a day for six months and then followed that with 1,000 IUs a day for, for another six months. And they found reduced fatigue and depression. Um, I do like to point out with this study that first six months dose is over the tolerable upper intake level. So the tolerable upper intake level is 10,000 IUs a day. Um, and toxic effects can be a little more severe on this one. So vision changes, vomiting, headache, psychiatric symptoms, liver failure, cerebral edema. Um, so if you were looking at that as a supplement, you definitely want to be chatting with your doctor about it. And then there's some other areas of promising research. So um, each of these, I kind of, um, in the article I looked at, uh, it's either smaller studies or less well-controlled studies. So these are ones where I think there's definitely some potential, but there's not necessarily proof to say, yeah, go start taking these. Um, so thiamine or vitamin B1, um, there was a series of case reports that showed high-dose thiamine supplementation um, gave an improvement in fatigue, and there's not an upper, tolerable upper intake level for thiamine. Um, caffeine, there wasn't a lot for caffeine alone, but there is a study out of Belgium that found a reduced risk of MS progression associated with regular coffee consumption for patients with relapsing MS. They didn't find that association in patients with progressive MS. And it is notable that excessive caffeine intake can cause arrhythmias and seizures. The other thing that I like to point out just from clinical practice is caffeine can also disrupt your sleep. So if you're having issues with sleep, consider that before starting to bump your coffee intake to help yourself out. Uh, acetyl L-carnitine has been tested in some small trials. Uh, there's been mixed results, so there's not a tolerable upper intake level reported. Um, it does have some medication supplement interactions, so you want to be cautious on that one. Coenzyme Q10, there was a small study done of 48 patients with relapsing or emitting MS, and it improved fatigue and depression. Again, there's not an upper, a tolerable upper intake level, um, but high doses can cause GI irritability and affect liver function test results. Uh, Ginkgo biloba, they did a 22-person study with relapsing remitting MS and found improvements in depression, anxiety, fatigue, processing speed, um, but other studies haven't shown those cognitive improvements, so uh, still more research to come. Uh, no upper intake level is reported, but it can cause GI upset. Sorry, I feel like I'm one of those medication people where I'm saying all these side effects. Um, a few more uh, promising areas of research are lipoic acid. So there was a 51-person study of patients with secondary progressive MS that reported a reduction in brain atrophy. So they are doing um, a larger, or they're planning a larger phase two clinical trial. Um, there's not a tolerable upper intake level established for this, but it can cause low blood sugar and it can um, cause toxic effects to the kidney. Uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, they did a review of six trials. They found a trend toward less frequent relapses. Uh, there's not a tolerable upper intake level established for this, and um, the supplementation of polyunsaturated fatty acids can cause bleeding and low blood sugars. And then lastly, probiotics. There was a 12-week randomized controlled trial in 60 patients um, that reported favorable effects on clinical disability, uh, mood, inflammatory, and metabolic markers. Um, so additional studies are indicated that there's not an upper limit, and probiotics can sometimes cause GI upset, and then in rare cases, allergic reactions. So having gone through all of that stuff, what I want to give you guys is a tool to use if you're deciding on making diet changes or if you're deciding on making or adding a supplement or changing your supplement regimen, and that's your brain. So it's basically an acronym. So B is benefits, R is risks and costs, A is alternatives, I is intuition, and N is notify your provider. So if you're looking at a diet change or adding a supplement, first think about what are the potential benefits? Because a lot of those supplements, there were potential benefits, diet changes, there's, there's some potential benefits there as well. But also looking at the risks and the costs. So 
we talked about some of that. If you're overdoing it on that supplement, what could be um, the downside? The other thing is looking at the cost, not only for um, diet, but for supplements. As I said, that's a $40 billion industry. There's a lot of money going in there. So if you're going to spend quite a bit of money on a supplement, be aware of that cost. Um, A, the alternatives. So what alternatives are available? And one thing I like to think of there is if you're looking at supplements, see if there's a natural food source for that. So maybe you're looking at, hey, should I supplement omega-3s? My thought would be, are you already getting fish in three times a week, or is that maybe a better place to start? Um, Intuition, what does your gut tell you, or do claims seem too good to be true? So I've seen some of this where supplements are marketed really hard. Um, They tell you, you know, it's going fast, it's on sale, you know, if you don't act now, you know, that sort of marketing tactic. Um, So if they're pushing it really hard, I kind of have some red flags go up. So use your intuition, see what that tells you. And then lastly, if you do decide to make a change, um, talk to your providers. So let your doctor know, that way they can help you be aware of any supplement medication interactions, um, anything along those lines, and they know what you're doing. So that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for letting me come chat with you. Uh, If you have questions, I put my contact info up there. Um, I also do work out of uh, Integrative Medicine Clinic at Stapleton, and we've got kind of a whole team of wellness people there. They do have a pharmacist also who works there who specializes in urban supplement management. So um, good team there. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. We will be taking a 15-minute break before the final presentation and the question and answer session. This is your last chance to submit questions on your note cards. Volunteers, please raise your hands. Please send your questions to these folks. You can also continue to fill out your evaluation forms. This feedback helps shape our educational programming all year long. We will be back at 11... Oh, eight. Thank you.
Yeah. yeah. I'm getting ready to do. of the morning. I would like would like to once again point out the blue evaluation sheet in your packet. If you provide us with contact information, your completed evaluation will be entered into a drawing for one of two $25 gift cards as a thank you for your feedback. This feedback is absolutely essential and is critical in helping us shape our education programming. The MS Center has an education task force committee, which is made up of people living with MS, staff, board members, and clinicians. This task force carefully reviews the evaluations in an ongoing effort to ensure that these events are engaging, informative, and useful to you. You can leave the finished evaluation on your table or drop it off in the evaluation box at the registration table on your way out. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Amanda Paquet. Her research interests include optimizing diagnosis and treatment for patients with autoimmune neurological diseases. Dr. Paquet will be presenting on secondary progressive MS. All right, so is this on? Can you hear me now? All right. Uh, so wrapping up the morning here with the last talk, we're going to talk about secondary progressive MS uh, with a focus on some clinical signs and symptom management. <laughs> Long morning. Uh, so just to, just to kind of outline what we're going to talk about a bit today, I'm just going to define secondary progressive MS. Uh, we're going to talk about the transition period for patients from relapsing remitting MS to secondary progressive MS. Um, I have some data, preliminary data, that I'm going to share with you, uh, basically telling us what are secondary progressive MS patients in our clinic are telling us. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up with some symptomatic approaches. So this slide right here is, is very basic. Um, it is a oversimplifying way of defining different forms of MS. Um, this is just for, for definition's sake. We know that multiple sclerosis changes throughout the lifetime, and not everyone follows the textbook and fits into these nice, neat graphs. Uh, but just, just for simplicity's sake, um, looking at the top left-hand corner, we see relapsing remitting MS. And so for these patients, um, patients have relapses, they have acute attacks, cause neurologic dysfunction, followed by recovery. And these attacks happen over time with recovery in between. Now, when we're looking right underneath that with the orange uh, graph there, uh, that's in contrast to secondary progressive MS, where patients have these, again, acute relapses, uh, recovery, but then at some point over time, disability accumulates. And then just for complicity's sake, we'll talk about primary progressive MS uh, up on the top in the greenish color, uh, where you have um, not discrete attacks, but this slow progression, this disability accumulation, over time. So moving on to focusing on secondary progressive MS. Now, this transition period is not as, as cleanly defined as we can see here on this slide that I have uh, circled in red. Uh, we, unfortunately, in the clinic are usually um, making this decision on progression in retrospect. Um, but there are some features that we see in retrospective studies um, that can help us um, because we see these things creep up during this transition period. And while we don't have a defined clinical test, a defined biomarker to say, yes, you're exactly right here on this graph where you're, where you're progressing, um, we can use these clues to help us. And it really helps us with focusing on some of these symptoms in clinic. So what we see are more severe neurologic symptoms, more frequent hospitalizations, more pronounced cognitive defects, 
uh, we see higher levels of fatigue, higher levels of depression, higher levels of anxiety. And again, these symptoms are not isolated to patients with secondary progressive MS, but they tend to just be a little more susceptible to these symptoms. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to, to show you some data what we've collected in our clinic at the Rocky Mountain MS Center. Uh, we do these questionnaires. Uh, we call them patient-reported outcomes, where you are basically telling us what are your symptoms. And we have a, a bunch of these questionnaires. We use uh, neuroqual testing. Uh, the ones I'm going to focus on here in this talk uh, is cognition, fatigue, depression, and anxiety. Um, if you haven't seen one of these in the clinic, this is just to give you an example of what these questionnaires ask and what they look for. Um, so, for example, when we're focusing on, on cognition, we will ask questions, you know, how many times do you have to read something to remember it? Uh, my thinking was, or is slow. Um, I feel like it's really hard to pay attention. I have a difficult time concentrating. These are the types of questions we are asking. And when we looked at uh, the data that we had with collection of these um, questionnaires, we had about 700 patients with relapsing remitting MS and about 100 patients with secondary progressive MS that, that uh, filled out this survey. And what we see is patients with secondary progressive MS reported slightly more cognitive issues than relapsing remitting patients. Now moving on to fatigue. Uh, fatigue can affect MS patients at any point of the disease. Often it's actually a very early sign. Um, but here in this questionnaire, we're asking things like, I feel exhausted, I have no energy, I feel fatigued, I'm too tired to do household chores, I'm tired, uh, those sorts of things. And again, you know, that same cohort of, of patients, about 700 with uh, relapsing remitting, about 100 with secondary progressive uh, MS, we found that secondary progressive MS patients did report more fatigue than relapsing remitting patients. Uh, moving on to, uh, just to give you some example of what questions we ask with depression, um, you know, just I feel depressed, I feel hopeless, um, you know, I feel empty inside, those sorts of things. Um, here, this was our most profound difference between, between our two groups of relapsing remitting M MS patients and secondary progressive, but we did see that secondary progressive MS patients reported more depression. Uh, moving on to anxiety, so answering questions like, I feel uneasy, I feel nervous, uh, I have a difficult time calming down, uh, I feel panicked. Uh, here, we actually saw the opposite. So we had more patients with relapsing remitting MS have more anxiety than secondary progressive MS patients. And this might just be, again, this is preliminary data, a factor of that we had a lot more patients in the relapsing remitting category answer these questions. It may be that we were asking these questions of relapsing remitting patients that was at the time of their diagnosis. Um, that, that could be a possibility. And so just moving on to um, kind of the, the cycle of MS symptoms. Um, many symptoms of MS are related to one each other. They depend on each other. And it may just be that one untreated symptom can just make everything worse. And so, for instance, if we have a patient with a significant amount of fatigue, that might contribute to their depression. And... When you feel depressed, you don't have energy, you don't feel like doing anything, your exercise decreases. You decrease your exercise, you get deconditioned, you have some muscle atrophy, um, and maybe you make spasticity worse. Another example is uh, someone with MS might have bladder problems. They have to wake up a lot in the middle of the night, they go to the bathroom, it disrupts their sleep. So when you don't sleep well, you don't think well. Um, we know that sleep disorders, like sleep apnea, significantly increase cognitive issues and significantly increase fatigue. So what is the most common MS symptom? You can yell it out. Fatigue, yes. So over 75% of patients with MS report fatigue. 
Fatigue can be one of the first signs or an early sign of MS. In fact, um, up to 30% of patients, it's the first symptom that they report. And then almost half of patients uh, on a daily basis are, are struggling with fatigue. Oops. So how do we deal with this? There's many, many different ways to deal with fatigue. And it's not just one single approach. Uh, usually it takes a multifactorial approach. And so the first thing we can do is improve mobility, improve exercise. Another approach that we can take is energy conservation and cooling techniques. Uh, the, the summer can be rough when you have MS. The heat makes fatigue worse. And so doing things like avoiding the heat as much as you can or doing cooling techniques like cooling vests can sometimes help manage these symptoms. Uh, when I talk about energy conservation, I'm talking about strategic rest periods. Strategic naps can sometimes help. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of treating other medical conditions that can make fatigue worse. Uh, we have to look for these things, talk about these things, and then treat them. So, for example, infection makes fatigue worse. Something as simple as a urinary tract infection can, can make you quite, quite debilitated. Um, sometimes it's a matter of treating underlying uh, comorbid disease such as depression or mood disorders. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of just pain making fatigue worse, so targeting our treatment uh, with, with pain therapies. Uh, and then, like I said before, uh, treating sleep can really help. Um, give you some energy. So looking for other things that affect sleep, like restless leg syndrome, um, sleep apnea, for example. And then we have prescription medications that we use in the clinic that can help treat fatigue. And uh, this includes uh, stimulants, amantadine, and various forms. The second most problematic and difficult to treat symptom in MS is cognitive dysfunction. Cognitive dysfunction is very prevalent in MS patients, anywhere to up to 65%. It often goes um, underrecognized, misdiagnosed. Sometimes misdiagnosed is just you're stressed, you're anxious, you have depression. Um, and it's important to recognize this cognitive dysfunction because it can severely impact quality of life. Um, it's, it contributes to things like unemployment, accidents, um, problems with just participating in daily activities, loss of social contacts. Um, and we know through many studies that cognitive dysfunction is strongly related to uh, disease burden with the number of lesions that we see on the MRI, brain atrophy that we see on MRI. And so just like management of fatigue, cognitive treatment usually requires a multifactorial approach. Not one single thing may be the cure-all. Um, so just starting out with management of physical symptoms may help and lifestyle changes. So let's just take, for example, we have a, uh, a woman with MS that works at a bank, as a bank teller. She's standing all day. She has problems with um, incontinence. And so that struggle of dealing with incontinence at her job um, makes her anxiety worse. And that worsening anxiety affects her cognition and her ability to concentrate at work. So it may just be making sure that from a medical standpoint, we adequate, adequately treat the incontinence um, and we provide her with lifestyle changes, meaning maybe some strategic and planned bathroom breaks throughout the day that do not interfere with her work. Um, when we get control of that situation, her anxiety comes down. Her anxiety comes down and, we're, and her cognition is a bit better due to that. Uh, another example of lifestyle changes is multitasking. No human on this planet can multitask. <laughs> Men are probably worse. Uh, <laughs> but for patients with MS, it's, it's very, very difficult. The, the part of the brain that requires attention is often affected with cognitive impairment. And so 
Let's just take another example. We have someone who works in a busy work environment at a desk in the middle of a high traffic area. Um, they're trying to concentrate on doing their work, but there's so many distractions, so much noise that they cannot focus on getting their work done. Um, we move that person into a quieter corner, uh, maybe their own office, and they perform so much better. Um, now, moving on to another uh, approach of cognitive treatment is really treating MS itself. So adequate treatment with disease-modifying therapy to minimize relapses, minimize lesion burden, and minimize brain atrophy is a way to avoid uh, cognitive impairment. Uh, we heard already today that you know, treating the disease early in the process, minimizing these things, will lead to better outcomes. And then treatment of coexisting medical conditions can help with cognitive impairment. I alluded to this already. So treatment of um, sleep disorders, like sleep apnea, um, can improve fatigue, improve cognition. So sometimes it's just a matter of you know, asking the right questions in clinic with patients. Do you snore at night? Are you falling asleep easily, watching TV? You know, those sorts of things. You know, when, when we ask about fatigue, um, you know, we sometimes have to ask more questions than, are you fatigued? You know, when do you get fatigued? Do you wake up feeling refreshed? If you don't wake up feeling refreshed, you're not sleeping well. Um, and then we have uh, non-pharmacological approaches, uh, such as cognitive rehab and exercise. In cognitive rehab, we're basically uh, working with patients um, and trying to maximize uh, the, the cognitive reserve that's left, the way of adapting to some of these deficits. Uh, exercise, studies have shown that, you know, a positive effect of this exor exercise has a positive effect on um, your cognition. Uh, there are symptomatic medications very similar to what we use for fatigue, uh, such as stimulants that can help with cognition and antidepressants. Um, and then just to summarize, you know, many of these symptoms that I talked about, cognitive impairment, uh, fatigue, um, I didn't get into motor dysfunction, but even that, you know, affect all these subtypes of MS. But it's really the patients in this transition period to secondary progressive MS that are just very vulnerable. Um, and we need to step back and look at the person as a whole because these symptoms are interrelated and require a multifactorial approach. And with that, I think I ended early, maybe. And we're going to go on to the Q&A session. OK? Thank you, Dr. Paquet. As David mentioned when he opened our program today, research is a critical component to our mission. At the RMMSC at CU, the doctors all have special research interests, including biomarkers, DMTs, and pediatric MS and other neurological diseases, among other things. This facility hosts a biorepository and a brain tissue bank to further MS research around the globe. I would now like to welcome all of our presenters back to the stage for a question and answer session.
That's right. All right. So we're going to do the Q&A uh, question and answer period a little bit differently. I've given cards that are relatively similar to the different uh, folks. All right. Technical problems. Uh, and what we're going to do is have them go through and, and look at the cards, try to group them into groups so we can get through as many as we can. We're going to go round robin, have each person take one minute to answer the first set of cards that they have. Uh, then let anybody else have any comments they want, then move on to the next person. We'll just keep going round robin as long as we can until we run out of time. Okay. So, Holly, you get to start. Okay. I don't know if this is... Okay. The... Oh, no. Just go ahead. The first question that I... Louder. The first question that I have... Can you guys... No? It's... You're on... They're just adjusting it inside here. So just go ahead and talk. Okay. There we go. Uh, the first question is, was the dose of vitamin D in the cited study 1,400 or 14,000 IU per day? And it was 14,000 IU per day. And then the next question on the card was, uh, what is the effective daily dosing of biotin in the study? So I think this kind of encompassed two questions that one another person had later. Um, the adequate intake for biotin is 30 micrograms per day in the study. Uh, the first one, that was the open label, they used 100 to 300 milligrams a day, so a much higher amount. And then in the 12-month multi-center randomized control trial, it was 100 milligrams of biotin three times daily. So keep going for a minute. Okay. Um, next questions I had were some of the uh, studies that I had mentioned were very small samples, why I mentioned such studies, and I think part of that is because they did see positive results from some of those studies, so um, showing that there's potential for further benefit. Um, I did go through, in addition to this article, a lot of other articles, and unfortunately at a lot of the end of them, there were these small sample trials, and so they would say, you know, we found really good benefit, and this needs to be proven in larger studies. So I think that's kind of where some of the research is at that point. So I didn't want to ignore them just because they were small, but I think knowing that it's not necessarily a go start this plan at home yet. John? All right, this one more. Nope, just, just give me a second to get it turned up. Again. <laughs> So we're, we're just going to pass one mic. How's around. that? Yeah. All right. Um, the first question is about the RISE MS and uh, early RISE, which is uh, hopefully going to start soon. So uh, RISE uh, MS stands for risk factors in early MS. Um, and what this represents is a study which is trying to identify very earliest markers of disease activity in people who are at high risk of developing MS. And... Uh, we are focusing specifically on uh, relatively younger, age 18 to 30 at first, but we'll go down to age 10, um, hopefully in a few months, uh, up to age 30. So prior to the majority of people who develop clinical symptoms of MS. And uh, the concept is that everyone uh, who participates in the study will be a first degree relative of someone who has MS. So typically an offspring or a sibling of someone with MS. And they are at high risk of developing MS because of their genetic component. So everyone will receive an abbreviated, non-contrasted MRI scan of the brain. It's about 15 minutes, focused only on three short sequences that are directly related to MS and not a bunch of other sequences that are relatively more peripheral. Uh, they will have a significant amount of blood drawn um, uh, and will also fill out some paper and pencil tests about where were you born, uh, what is your diet like, um, uh, do you smoke? Uh, what was your weight during adolescence and things like that? A variety of things to which you may or may not have been exposed. Uh, and then um, the concept is, is that everyone who um, gets the MRI scan will have, in fact, the report given to them. Now, the majority of these so far, not surprisingly, have been normal with no abnormalities seen there. Otherwise, young, healthy individuals, because all of these indi uh, individuals will be asymptomatic. Um, if, however, an individual has even a single lesion that is uh, relatively representative of MS, that is in a, uh, in a significant specific location, or if they have two or more lesions in classical, uh, typical locations for MS, um, they will be offered to uh, follow up with us outside the study to do a more complete evaluation, which might include 
other imaging, for example, of the spine, uh, perhaps doing some blood tests, uh, perhaps even doing a spinal tap, and then trying to assess whether or not they have any significant risks uh, at that point in time uh, for occurrence uh, for disease activity clinically. As I mentioned on the slide earlier, um, in radiologic isolated syndrome, uh, not by accident also RIS because what we're looking for is asymptomatic individuals with inflammatory lesions on their scan. Um, if you're a young man under the age of 37 uh, and you have a, uh, uh, a spinal cord uh, lesion in addition to asymptomatic brain lesions, your risk of having clinical disease activity in the next couple of years is pretty high. Uh, there's actually a clinical trial right now comparing Tecfidera to placebo in that patient population, that is, with radiologic isolated syndrome. But the real pr overlying purpose of the study is to try to um, uh, get a handle on, are there markers in the blood? Are there markers uh, by exposures or other things? When we look at people, hopefully in longitudinal studies, uh, that will be uh, very early markers that will tell us this individual, although they're at high risk, is at really high risk, or this individual, although they're in theory at high risk, maybe has a much lower risk and needs to be monitored much less. So uh, that's the purpose of the study. Everyone will get the results of their MRI scan. Okay. Uh, go ahead. You started. I'll just turn it off and pass it so I'm not coughing in the microphone. Uh, so the next question is, how common is it for MS patients to have migraines? I do not have a number off the top of my head, but it is very common. Uh, we see this a lot in the clinic. Uh, and as I alluded to, certain medical conditions uh, that make cognition worse along with MS, uh, migraines can be one of them. Um, this is something that uh, we often treat with daily medications to, to avoid uh, migraines, migraine prophylaxis. And uh, in the right setting, sometimes we can overlap um, and uh, treat as many symptoms as possible with a single pill for migraines. So for instance, we have migraine medications that uh, make you sleepy. So if you, insomnia is an issue, we can help you sleep. Um, we have uh, other medications that overlap with neuropathic pain management, so we could target two things at once. Uh, so in speaking of, um, in terms of effectiveness of treatments, one of the question is, uh, can you define inadequate response? Uh, seems like an easy question, uh, but hard definition, and probably why I avoided trying to ask it. Uh, so the issue is, depending on who you ask, uh, some people will have more tolerance than others. Uh, at our center, we definitely don't have much tolerance. Again, the issue of can we meet that no evidence of disease activity. So if we see new MRI lesions, any clinical symptoms, uh, things like that, for us, that's a failure of, dis of, of the treatment in, in switching over. I would differentiate between sort of treatments for relapses, treatments for progression. So I don't necessarily expect certain treatments to really be able to slow down progression. That's not, I mean, we would like that to be the case, um, but not something that we kind of expect from those treatments. Um, along those lines, define a relapse. So a, a relapse are symptoms that last technically for 24 hours. The idea with relapses is you're trying to go for things that are inflammation-based. In other words, you got bumped in the head, you got a bruise, and as you would expect, like if you got bumped in the arm, that bruise isn't going to come and go within just a few seconds or maybe hours. That bruise is going to last for at least some period of time. And so we do try and separate that a little bit from pseudo-relapse. Not that you're making up those symptoms, they're real symptoms, um, but those are kind of the symptoms more related to prior uh, attacks, for example. So there's no inflammation and we're trying to separate that out. And those are things that get brought out by fevers, infections, not sleeping well, stress, things like that, um, that can kind of come up. And so oftentimes the first thing you'll notice when you call the clinic and you're saying, hey, I've got some new symptoms, why does this nurse keep asking me about my peeing? The reason is is because we're trying to hunt for things that might you know look for infections. So urinary tract infections are common, colds, things like that. Those tend to be the most common things because again we're using such high efficacy treatments that we don't really a lot of times expect relapses. And so in trying to kind of separate those two things, I would bring that out. Um, now the issue of whether they're self-reported. So yes, the patient does have to tell us. Technically, there's supposed to be things that we could objectively measure, like I should be able to do an exam and kind of measure it. And for clinical trials, that's the definition. 
in clinical practice, that's not the case. Um, and so this is kind of where the definitions get a little bit muddled. Um, so if we see new symptoms, we want to try and set, you know, separate those out. If they're new symptoms, we get more worried about it. If you're typical symptoms, we worry a little bit less about it. And we think about pseudo relapses in those cases. Okay. So, um, first question here is, uh, uh I talked about the brain and wanted me to comment on MS activity in the spinal cord. So remember, this is a disease of the central nervous system. And by definition, the spinal cord, the brain, and the optic nerve are the central nervous system. MS affects any part of those. And it's a random process. The, the issue, is, though, is that the ability of the spinal cord to compensate for the inflammation and mask it is lower than it is in the brain. So lesions in the spinal cord, particularly in earlier disease, are worrisome to us from a prognostic standpoint. Same is true for early optic neuritis. If we don't treat, those patients are at higher risk of developing significant loss of vision. So location is important, uh, but they're all part of the same environment. And then the second question about this was the autonomic nervous system. Uh, the autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that basically takes care of daily housekeeping chores. So it's taking care of managing your blood pressure and your heart rate and your respiration rate. It's also involved in managing bowel and bladder function. It's not generally directly attacked in MS. There are some mechanisms in the brainstem that would impact it. But in general, it's a, it has secondary, it, it, it's injured in a secondary way. So autonomic dysfunction in MS patients is common and can lead to a number of different problems. For example, patients with MS will notice that their legs and their arms sometimes will be cold and turn blue. And that's because the autonomic nervous system is not regulating blood supply to those extremities correctly. So it can be involved in an indirect way. So I have a few questions here that are regarding inflammation. Um, so what causes inflammation from a diet standpoint? One of the biggest things that I'm looking at is sugar intake. Um, the other piece of that is kind of that red meat, processed meats um, factor as well. Uh, and then how to avoid or reduce it. Um, so... As far as from a diet standpoint, any of those three diets that I mentioned, like a Mediterranean diet or a DASH diet, um, ones that are more um, whole grains, looking at vegetables, looking at fruits, having those be kind of the basis of your diet are going to help to reduce it. Avoiding the junk food, the refined products, a lot of that stuff um, can help to reduce it. Uh, as part of kind of that same line, people have asked uh, benefits on turmeric. So turmeric was not one that I have seen a study specifically related to MS and turmeric intake. Um, turmeric is definitely anti-inflammatory, so I think it's fine to include that from a, are you using it as a spice? Are you using it in your cooking? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say to go out and start taking a bunch of supplements of it yet, just because we don't have the evidence to say that at this point. So, um. okay. All right, the next question for me was, uh, what did the data from the recently completed stem cell transplant study show? Does the benefit appear to outweigh the risk? So this was the one that I alluded to was the first uh, controlled trial, that is individuals who went on the stem cell therapy, and, and it was low-dose immunoablation, that is, it was not completely crushing the bone marrow. Let me go backwards. You take bone marrow, you take stem cells out of the bone marrow, you store them. You then can do one of three things. Do nothing more to the bone marrow and just give the stem cells back. You can partially um, uh, inhibit production uh, in the bone marrow, or you can really crush the bone marrow, the latter being high-dose immunoablation therapy. And then you would give the stem cells back to rescue uh, the bone marrow, because without the bone marrow, you would be in significant trouble uh, not having an immune system, essentially. So this was a medium uh, dose of immunoablation followed by stem cell rescue. And uh, the uh, comparative group was anybody uh, who was not receiving that was taking any of a variety of different disease-modifying therapies, including some that were on high-efficacy therapies and some on low-efficacy uh, low therapies. And... Uh, uh, so this was open label, that is everybody knew what they were getting, uh, but it was controlled and the outcomes were blinded. That is, the, the people who were doing the actual, looking at MRI scans, doing the evaluations clinically, were blinded to what people were uh, taking. And so um, in this study, uh, what was shown uh, was that there was a significant benefit to the individuals who uh, had received the uh, stem cell therapy. Uh, notably, 
to get into this study, you had to have highly active disease. I believe it was two relapses within the last year uh, while on a standard disease-modifying therapy. Uh, and so uh, this was called the Mistral, M-I-S-T. And um, uh, there were a number of different drugs that were used as the comparators, including some on high-efficacy therapy. Um, and so uh, what is notable uh, further going forward is that there's going to be a study called BEAT-MS, B-E-A-T-M-S. Uh, we'll hopefully start this summer. It'll be... Um, uh, I think a little bit more rigorous than this trial, and it will show uh, it will uh, compare only to high efficacy therapies. So the comparator group will be uh, people taking natalizumab, tisabri, ocrelizumab, ocrevus, or alemtuzumab, lemtrada. It will similarly though be in, in uh, relatively active uh, patients. Uh, in addition, what was uh, what has been shown in numerous studies in the past. Uh, with the uh, prior uh, open-label uncontrolled uh, stem cell studies is that uh, similar to the disease-modifying therapies, the people who benefit the greatest are the youngest patients with active disease, individuals with older, uh, who are older uh, with progressive MS, unfortunately, have not benefited to any significant degree with the stem cell transplants to date. And I'm actually going to go to another question since that links into yours a little bit, and I can jump on that. Uh, someone asked, should someone with primary progressive MS or secondary progressive MS consider a stem cell transplant to control the disease of their uh, condition in terms of continuous decline? Um, and as you heard from Dr. Corboy, uh, the studies have clearly shown that it works best with, with active um, and a, aggressive disease up front. And uh, the second question to this is, is there no other drug options for these patients? And I think that's something um, that was included in Dr. Alvarez's slides, uh, that now, now we actually have some medications, at least um, that are FDA approved for active uh, progressive secondary, um, or secondary progressive MS. Um, and so I, while the... While the Easy answer is, is no for the stem cell transplant. I think uh, these drug options are something that should be discussed with, with your physician. I just took a comment on that as well. The, uh, the stem cell transplant has a high, significantly higher immediate risk profile than most of our other medications do. And it specifically uh, excludes patients with progressive disease because it did not help. In fact, it made many of them worse. The assumption that stem cell transplant could provide superior effects to our higher efficacy drugs is not supported by any data. So there is a group that promotes stem cell transplant. They're highly invested in it, and they need to do the right study, which is the study that Dr. Corboy talked about before we start making these assumptions. We had a number of questions related to brain atrophy and kind of disability correlations, and brain atrophy is probably the most tightly linked um, measure that we have that correlates with disability of, of all the MRI measure type things. Um, but specifically one question, and I'll get to that, it seems kind of maybe roundabout way. So hypothetically, so I'm looking for a, a young woman here, let's see, female diagnosed at age 22, gets on DMT right away, which is effective. So questions, how does having her MS affect uh, one, life expectancy? So in the, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we would say that it might reduce life expectancy by three, four, five years, something like that. Uh, some studies out of Norway have shown that uh, life expectancy is really only affected by maybe months at this point. Uh, so I think we're having a huge effect on life expectancy. So the more we talk about morbidity as sort of disability. And unfortunately, that's kind of where MS falls in under. And so before treatment, we would kind of expect that um, every for every 10 to 15 years, about 50% of people would become secondary progressive, starting needing to use a cane as far as disability goes. So if you add another 15, then that would be 75%, another, you know, that kind of stuff. And so the second question is period of time she is able to be in the workforce. So with our drugs, the answer is we don't know because they're very new. New. But the reality is that we keep seeing a lot of patients who have been treated very, you know, with highly effective therapies from the get go, where it doesn't 
we don't see disability progression. And so I think it would become sort of until retirement age um, is the plan. So any studies on these issues? So we have had a couple of studies uh, that were started by Dr. Vollmer and that I've been involved with as well, looking at patients who were stable, stable. So, you know, we, we couldn't pick up any relapses. They, the MRIs look good, you know, no new lesions, things like this for at least two years. And then continued on a number of different medications, including Copaxone, um, Jelenia, Tasabri, and healthy non-MS type patients. And what we saw is that the brain atrophy changes over two next two years um, was the same in all four groups. And so it doesn't look like, it looks like we can pick up changes as they happen without necessarily seeing sort of any advanced disability. Now it's over two years, um, but that helps us a little bit. And so there were some questions about Copaxone and related to is how's that 30% related to other drugs. It looks like if you're stable, stable, that it's looking good. If you're having disease activity, what we know is that those relapses will chew up your brain faster. And that tends to be when we tend to see the biggest changes in brain volume. And so it, the, the percent changes that we see for different drugs really varies on whether you're back to being stable or not stable and having disease activity. Okay. Does my mic still work? Okay. I guess not. So just to follow up on the, on the MRI theme, there are a couple questions about what's the normal rate of brain volume loss in healthy controls. So the brain volume, as I said, tends to peak in the early 20s. It's pretty stable until the 30s or so. And then there's a slow uh, loss of brain volume in normal healthy adults. Initially, it's quite low, 0.01% or less. Uh, the rate of brain volume loss accelerates by the time that you're in your 60s or 70s. Rate of brain volume loss may be between... 0.04 and 0.07. And that's the rate of brain volume loss we see in 20-year-old MS patients. And so that's why shutting, treating early and shutting off the inflammation to preserve brain is so important at early age, because if we don't, they're going to use up that neurological reserve and enter the progressive phase of the disease. And this, right along with this is questions about evaluating gray matter. Can we do that without having to do an autopsy? Yes, we do it all the time. So MRI gives us a lot of information about gray matter. We can actually measure the volume of neurons relatively specifically by looking at specific markers in the waveforms that characterize MRIs. We have PET scanning that we can use. And we also are, think we can be doing it by monitoring blood tests. And so one of the questions was, was when, when we have the NFL assay in place. Well, NFL stands for neural filament light. It's an integral protein in neurons. When neurons are damaged or killed, uh, that is released into the fluid surrounding the brain, and some of that leaks into the blood system. And we put in a purchase order this last week to buy a machine that may allow us to measure that in the blood. And so our goal is to be able to monitor for rate of neuronal damage in patients by using a blood test and using that to help complement what we see on MRIs. I got a couple of questions on these about nightshades. Um, and what I like to think of is kind of the risk versus benefit of eliminating those. So I believe the main component of nightshades that people get worried about is the lectins. Um, but nightshades also have quite a bit of antioxidants. There's vitamins. These are healthy vegetables other than that. Um, so I think it's going to be one of those where if you wanted to trial eliminating those, you could see how that affects you, but you'd want to make sure you're getting plenty of other vegetables. So if those are the vegetables that you like, and by eliminating those, you're taking a bunch of vegetables out of your diet, I think that could potentially do a lot more harm than good. Um, so I think it's what else would you be substituting in for those foods is what I would be looking at. Um, and then do you want me to, should I go for a whole minute or do you want me to just answer one question? Sorry. I'll just keep rotating around. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, this question is about, uh, please update us on the study about stopping disease-modifying therapies in older patients. Uh, so this is what we call a DISCO-MS study, the discontinuation study. Um, uh, the uh, concept is to look at uh, relatively older individuals, that is 55 and older, noting that all of the studies until uh, two weeks ago when saponamide was approved, all the prior studies that had approval, the actual uh, uh, maximum age in all of those studies was actually 55. So noting that we have actually no data on people over the age of 55 within a, with any of these medicines prior to saponamide, uh, the concept is that 
by age 55, about 95% of all relapses have already occurred if you take the MS population as a whole, yet 55 and older accounts for 46% of all individuals in the United States with MS. So there's a very large disconnect between uh, when relapses occur and perhaps when people are using medications right now. So for individuals 55 and older, if they have not had a relapse for five years and no scan change for at least three years, and they've been continuously taking one of the disease-modifying therapies, they're candidates for the study. So far, we've enrolled 178 patients at 15 centers in the United States, and uh, the goal is to hit uh, 250 to 300 uh, over the course of the next eight to 10 months. Uh, so we'll have to do uh, you know, whatever number each month over the next several months. The, out, the primary outcome is whether or not you have a new scan change or a relapse any time in the study. Uh, secondary outcomes is have you had a change on your examination? We use a scale called the EDSS, which is the Extended Disability Status Scale, and um, uh, uh, movement on that scale is considered uh, significant if you move at least one point out of 10 points on that scale. And then we also have a variety of patient-reported outcomes as to how they're feeling, how they're doing, measuring some uh, cognitive tests and other things. And uh, so using three different types of outcomes, we're hoping to ask the question, uh, is it safe to take someone off their disease-modifying therapy in this context? Uh, uh, this is, will not be measuring taking people off drug when they're 35 years old with active disease. This is really a, a specific context of individuals who have had relative stability uh, uh, after prolonged use of one of the medications. So we do have, the only outcome we know so far is that we do have some safety checks built into this, including looking at how people are doing at six months, um, because we know that when people are taken off drugs, it's, it's different for different medications. Uh, but by six months, many individuals would have started to have recurrence of disease activity. So we built in a safety scan at six months, and we had uh, the first 50 people who hit six months, uh, 25 in each group, uh, were assessed, and the Data Safety Monitoring Board, uh, who is aware of all the data, they are unblinded while we are blinded, um, they said that there is no reason to stop the study. So uh, we don't know what that means beyond that there were no safety signals, but we'll do another safety examination actually at the end of the month or so uh, with the first 130 people who've hit six months. And if there is no safety signal, then we'll continue the study. All right, so the next question is on vaccines. If B cells are what helps us from not getting the flu using a flu shot, does it still work when you use uh, disease-modifying therapy to kill those cells? Uh, so just taking a step back and talking about vaccines uh, first in MS. Um, so when, when you're on a disease-modifying therapy, whether it's anti-CD20s, which is alluded to in this question, uh, or any immune-suppressing uh, drug, we are not able to use live vaccines. Uh, when I say live vaccines, this is a live virus. It includes uh, measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, uh, those sorts of vaccines. Uh, we, we do use old chicken. I'm, that's chicken pox. I'm talk, I'll talk about shingles in a second. <laughs> 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 Primary VZV. <laughs> um, so where was I? But, but we, you know, using um, dead vaccines or inactivated uh, virus, uh, we, we, believe is okay. And so that includes uh, flu, uh, pneumovax, so your pneumococcal, um, tetanus, pertussis, those sorts of things. Um, and so uh, while there was a study with uh, specifically in ocrelizumab looking at those four vaccines, flu, uh, tetanus, pertussis, um, and pneumococcal, uh, it showed that, you know, there was no safety concerns for patients. There was some slight decrease in efficacy, uh, meaning it was a bit harder to mount that immune response. Uh, but regardless, you know, there was still a lot of patients that were protected uh, and did form those antibodies. So we generally recommend in clinic every year getting the flu shots, even if you do not have as robust of a response as you would uh, off the drug, it still is going to protect you from more severe disease. And then getting to um, the, the chicken pox question. So there's a new vaccine, so primary chicken pox, so the, the vaccine that you, that actually most people in this room probably did not get because most people in this room had chicken pox. Uh, but now as of 94 
93, they started using uh, a live vaccine for, for pediatrics uh, to avoid getting chickenpox. And now um, we have a vaccine for shingles. Uh, the original vaccine was a live vaccine. We now have a vaccine out that's a, a dead uh, vaccine. Um, and the FDA looked at this and actually showed that the dead vaccine actually works better than the live vaccine. The question is, because this is not a live vaccine, can we use it? now in our, in our patients that are immune compromised. And unfortunately, um, you know, there's still data lacking on whether or not that particular vaccine uh, is safe in immunocompromised individuals. Uh, there are some ongoing studies now looking at patients with uh, underlying uh, cancers on chemotherapy, um, and I think there will be one out uh, on rheumatoid arthritis, but we still don't know what this means for the MS population. Um, so we're looking into, you know, perhaps studying that here, but that's kind of ongoing research. No. What were you told a year ago? Uh, you said it was different from what you were told a year ago. So what were you told? Yes, yes, absolutely. So it's not a safety issue. It's an efficacy issue. So uh, at this point, we would recommend getting the Shingrix vaccine, uh, particularly if you're going on Gelenia or Saponamod because they have a significant increased risk of shingles. It's just that we can't tell you accurately how effective it's going to be. I, I, would, I would also add one small caveat to that. That is that this particular vaccine is in, uh, has an adjuvant associated with it. That's, uh, those are... Um, uh, agitators, if you will, that help the immune system react with the, uh, with the actual vaccine. Uh, this particular adjuvant has only been used in one other vaccine, a malarial vaccine. And uh, there is, I think, a potential safety issue. That is, will this somehow stir up the MS with the adjuvant? That is unknown. I would say that we've certainly had a number of our patients take the vaccine. And in my experience so far, no one has had any significant problems with it. But as the MS patients were not part of the safety studies, I think the real answer is we just don't know. Uh, I'll do another quick series of questions regarding monoclonal antibodies. So these are very specific drugs. Most of the infusions for us are that way. Uh, so one particular question is, can we combine those drugs? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's always a little bit of a concern about um, if you use drugs that all lower the immune system. Are you lowering the system too much? Can you combine it with orals? Kind of the same thing applies. The uh, rheumatologists do this all the time, for example. It's just how good is the drug is. We do it all the time sometimes for other conditions outside of MS. We've had pretty good luck with the MS drugs, so maybe less need for doing that. Um, but the combination, for example, with the headache monoclonal antibodies, that, that's fine. Uh, that's not been an issue because uh, those don't lower the immune system, for example. Um, I think Tim and I both have one patient each that uh, is on, a, on two different monoclonals that lower the immune system in different ways, one for MS for us and one for uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Um, and so sometimes you just have to target different parts of the immune system to kind of get at different diseases and things like that. The other series of questions was differences, similarities between Ocrevus and Rituximab. So a lot of our data for Ocrevus is still kind of up and coming. It just really got developed two years ago. So we're starting to get two-year data on that uh, here in the next couple of months. At the one-year mark, we're seeing really good efficacy from both of them. Big differences I would point out are probably cost. Uh, with rituximab being a lot cheaper. Um, the other differences between them, a little bit more on the biology side of things, is how they kill cells is a little bit different. Uh, the analogy I tend to use is whether I shoot you or I stab you, does it make too much of a difference? Uh, probably not. Um, the other part of it is um, Ocrevus is a little bit more humanized, so the chances of getting reactions where you're actually developing antibodies to the drug might be a little bit lower with ocrelizumab. That we don't know yet. We don't have an assay to look at that yet. The, the reality is that with rituximab, we see that very infrequently. We've had maybe three cases of patients develop reactions because of actually antibodies, so different from the infusion reactions. So the reality is that for us, they're much more similar than they're different, and we tend to use them interchangeably depending on what we can kind of give from insurance companies. Did you have a comment? No. Okay. So I'm going to answer uh, one here that is one of my favorites here. 
So uh, it says, if the immune system starts the disease and astrocytes are part of it, what is the latest thinking about what initially triggers the disease and who's doing basic research to identify this? Well, I'm going to give you my view. So my view is, is that the uh, adaptive immune system is actually not the initiator of the disease. No, it's not the biological driver of the disease from an initiation standpoint. I think that the biological driver is probably astrocytes. And the reason for that is that if this is a due to a primary dysfunction in T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, which is the current thinking, then we really should see other autoimmune problems in MS patients. And by and large, we don't. There's no really good evidence that any other autoimmune disease is really overexpressed. Maybe a little bit of an exception with psoriasis, but it's a pretty weak signal. Um, so there are about 155 genes that have been identified as having some impact on risk of MS. And despite the fact that many of those genes actually operate through astrocytes, that bit of biology has not been investigated by the field. They focused on how those genes are operating through the traditional immune system, macrophages, monocytes, dendritic cells, lymphocytes, and a microglia in the brain. And so I think it's a, it's a problem in the field that the role of astrocytes is uh, been documented in different ways in different labs over the last 30 years, but there has not been an effort on the part of the NIH or National Society or anybody else to really push forward in that front. They've basically stayed stuck on the traditional view that this is a T-cell mediated disease, which we have clinical experience saying, not really. So the next question I got was how, or sorry, what are your recommendations for healthy fat types and levels? So I don't have a specific amount of fat that I recommend either limiting to or making sure that you get each day. Um, there used to be limitations on it, and I think part of that was when we thought fat was really bad for us and fat caused fat and all of that. Um, and I think a lot of that has been debunked. Um, as far as healthy fat types, though, I definitely have some thoughts there. So um, one of the healthiest types of fats is going to be your omega-3s. So definitely making sure that you're getting fish in or seafood or things like that as part of your weekly diet. Um, if you are vegetarian or if you're not eating those foods, looking at the plant-based sources for those, um, although those won't be sources of the EPA and DHA, they would still give you some of the omega-3s. So those are going to be things like chia seeds, walnuts, flax seeds. Um, kind of next down on the list is going to be your monounsaturated fat. So those are still healthy. So in um, cooking, I usually recommend either extra virgin olive oil, um, which is more meant for low temperature cooking. Uh, it hits its smoke point pretty early. So if you're cooking more high temperatures, I recommend avocado oil. Um, and then other types of healthy fats are going to be, which partly fall into that, is going to be avocados, nuts, seeds, making sure you're including those as part of a healthy diet. Um, Omega-6s are not necessarily unhealthy, but in the way that we consume them today in the ratios of omega-6s to omega-3s in the U.S. diet, we get a lot of omega-6s compared to our omega-3s. So it's not necessarily that they're bad. We do need some in our diet, but that tends to be more of your seed oils, your corn oils, your vegetable oils, and we have a lot of products that contain those, and we're eating a lot of those as compared to the omega-3s. So I think kind of getting that ratio a little bit better balanced can be helpful as well. And how late are we going, Tim? Let's make one more round. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a question that's uh, about what happens uh, when you stop medication. So this is um, that someone had heard news that once you stop Jelenia, the disease gets worse. Is this accurate? Um, so it's been known for quite some time with uh, many of the disease-modifying therapies that if you stop uh, the medication, there can be recurrence of disease activity, either by measuring MRI scans or by measuring relapses. It's not the same for all people. It's probably more true in younger patients with active disease, less true in older patients with less active disease. And it's also probably a difference between the different medications. Uh, it's notable that uh, Jelenia uh, and uh, Tysabri uh, seem to have uh, the worst of this in this regard. Uh, it's also notable that uh, both of them share something um, uh, common between them, and that is uh, that when you stop using the medication, in the case of Tysabri, Tysabri just is a monoclonal antibody that, that binds to a molecule called an integrin on the outside of white blood cells. Uh, when you stop using medication, it just simply falls off. It's a blocking agent. 
And so those white blood cells then are available to do what they would normally do. And for reasons that are not clear in a, in, in a significant minority of people, there seems to be a rebound of disease activity uh, occurring probably starting at about uh, 8 to 10 to 12 weeks, but maybe peaking at around 16 to 24 weeks. Similarly, with uh, Jelenia, um, uh, everyone's lymphocyte levels will go down, their white blood cell, the lymphocytes will go down because they get trapped in lymph nodes. After about 30 days, though, all those lymph nodes have released those lymphocytes, and they're back in action in the bloodstream. They've not been destroyed. They've just been trapped. And it is about that time that we start to see significant rebound of disease activity. That has been seen in, again, a minority of patients, generally young patients with relatively active disease before they started the drug. But some of these relapses have been very severe. Uh, and this has been known for probably about five or six years. Uh, but just in the last six months or so, the FDA added a package insert warning for Jelenia that you should not suddenly stop it without having a significant plan for replacing it. Um, uh, and in addition, it will be notable, siponimod, uh, the newer drug that's in the same class as fingolimod, Jelenia, uh, but uh, siponimod or mazent uh, acts in a similar fashion by trapping the white blood cells. Uh, but with this drug, they're released not in 30 days, but probably in about 10 days. And so it'll be interesting to see if that is the case, whether or not we start to see some rebound with that medication. That was not really seen in the studies because people continue to take the medication. Uh, and there was no uh, monitoring of any significant sense for people that left the studies. So uh, uh, that small difference in the way they work uh, may have a difference in terms of how we see this uh, so-called rebound of disease activity. Uh, so just a related question to that, just as a follow-up. So in the clinic, we do have sort of some process in place to try and reduce that because we've had such bad cases uh, in the sense that we basically try to continue your treatment before, right up until the day before your other treatment. If it's an infusion, we would kind of replace the next infusion, uh, those kinds of things. Um, as much as we can, sometimes, you know, just you need another refill or things like this. You miss a few days, that's fine. But we try to get away from washout periods and say a transition period. That's basically as minimal as we can. Okay. And I have a couple different questions on this card, some of which may have already been uh, addressed. But uh, just broadly speaking, uh, one of the questions here is what do you do when you're pregnant and you have MS? Uh, one of the other questions was, I'm pregnant on Jelenia. When do I stop? How soon after? I'm not sure if that means resume or um, how soon after you do, do you get pregnant after stopping. Uh, but just to talk about pregnancy uh, kind of in general here, you know, recognizing the, the statistics that over 50% of pregnancies are unplanned in the United States, um, you know, the best thing we can do is plan ahead. Uh, when you're on disease-modifying therapy. Um, and this may just even be cognitive to the fact in talking to patients, you know, they might not c come up to you and say, I'm planning on being pregnant in the next six months, uh, but recognizing when you have a young female patient in your clinic, uh, just knowing whether or not they're on birth control can sometimes be helpful when you have the conversation of what uh, DMT to start. Um, this was already alluded to, I think, today, but one of one of the approaches that we use in the clinic, because usually the the women who are getting pregnant are young women early in their disease course, we want to use these high efficacy drugs, uh, using things like ocrelizumab or rituximab that um, are highly effective, last for several months, up to twelve months, uh, but yet the the drug is out of the system in two to three months. So having that conversation in terms of pregnancy planning can be very helpful. Um, to get to the point here about Jelenia, that's, that's, that's one that I would generally not recommend on pregnancy. You heard about the complications about stopping that medication. Um, that is something for, for that very specific individual who asked this question, I think, um, requires a conversation with their doctor. Uh, question for me. So PML, uh, anything about research statistics? So I think it really depends on the drug that you're on as far as the statistics about it. We've seen um, cases starting with uh, in some of the orals and infusible. So I think there's been like uh, six cases on Tecfidera. For the most part, those have been patients who have been older, low counts of lymphocytes. We've seen uh, a few more cases on Jelenia. Those numbers kind of keep 
creeping up a little bit, uh, particularly in patients who've been on Jelenia for more than two years. Uh, again, older patients uh, as well there. Uh, Tesabri, though, is the main medication. We tend to really worry about it. Um, JC is proving to be a very good biomarker um, with most of the patients, vast majority, 90 plus percent of the patients having been JCV positive uh, on that blood test, and especially those with higher titers of that JCV ties. As far as research that's so being looked at to whether trying to inf- extending the period in between infusions, uh, that study hopefully will start soon uh, here to try and go from every four to every six weeks. It's going to be randomized. And uh, as far as the, the patient, as far as, uh, yeah, the patients will be switching over. We won't know. The patient will know how often they're getting the infusion, so they don't have to do like fake infusions or anything like that. Um, Hypothetically and theoretically, there's concerns with the CD20 medications. We've not really seen cases in MS that were pure CD20 type drugs. So when I'm talking about CD20s, those are the B-cell directed therapies. There have been cases in rituximab for other conditions, including rheumatologic conditions very similar to MS, which I think brings up the issue that we probably will see that, but the risk appears to be much lower than one in 30,000 is the guess from rheumatoid arthritis. the research as far as that goes, the most promising treatment courses at this point maybe appear to be T cells that are trained to attack this. Um, and so some some new strategies that are kind of coming up through clinical trials that way that are um, things being done at NIH and some companies are starting to lead efforts along those ways as well. So I think there may be treatment options coming up, but it may take a little while yet. Okay. So we're reaching the end of the Q&A period here. So... Um, I'll answer, give my opinion about something and you guys can comment on. So we have uh, two, two questions here. It says, there are so many drugs now. Why do companies continue to make new drugs for MS? And how can this be financially sensible for a drug company? And the other one is, MS is an incredibly expensive disease. Um, and, uh, for example, the billing cost for your Ocrevus at UCH here is $126,000. That's a billed cost. It's not what they expect to get paid. But as you saw on Dr. Alvarez's slides, these drugs start around $80,000 and go up by and large, except for uh, rituximab, which is a generic drug. And um, the reason that I think we've made so much progress in MS is partly the science and partly the fact that the companies were well reimbursed once they got FDA approval. And it's curious and not quite explainable uh, rationally that the initial cost of beta serum was about $12,000, now it's over $80,000. And it seems every year the prices of these drugs go up for no particularly good reason. That's the manifestation of American laws in American society. So these drugs, uh, many of them, like Mavenclad, for example, should not cost as much as it does. It's an old drug, it's easy to make. Um, and so that's something that'll have to be dealt with from a governmental standpoint. State governments and federal governments ultimately have to change the rules to affect that. But on the other hand, there was a benefit because the companies could make money. They did make a lot of investments, most of which failed, but we now have 20 FDA-approved therapies with MS being one of the most treatable diseases that we see in neurology, particularly if we can get it in early phase at first onset. So it's a complicated issue, but I think it is something that we do have to address. Any other comments? One of the challenges that's going to come up, I think, is that for monoclonal antibodies, the, the laws are different than they are for the pill. So as the pill patents wear off, it's going to be much easier to come up with generic versions of that. Um, we probably will not see generic versions of interferons because if if these biological drugs come out, they have to be proven through a clinical trial to be equivalent to another um, to the other drug that's already there. So with the CD20s, for example, what makes rituximab cheaper is that it was older, but it's also being used in a lot of other conditions that they can get money from. And with the population of MS patients being relatively small compared to rheumatoid arthritis, where there's probably 10 times as many patients, um, those prices will kind of continue to stay high for the biologicals. It's possible that you might get biosimilars. There's one or two biosimilars in the field of rheumatology already. Inflectra, for example, is an, is very similar to infliximab. And, and there's talk about trying to study that with rituximab. Um, but again, that would require clinical trials and who's going to pay for them and all that kind of stuff. So I think it will be a little bit of a challenge with monoclonals. Okay. So that will be the end of the 
Q&A session. I would like to thank you all very much for taking the time to come out. And for those of you that are online listening, we hope that it's useful to you. And again, thank you very much for coming. This concludes our program today. We thank you for joining us and for completing your evaluations. They can be left on your table or dropped in the blue box at, on the registration table on your way out. Thank you and have a great rest of your weekend. <laughs>